Well, we have done our due diligence, Diesel, and we have talked about golf our one time of the year. We're going to discuss golf <laughs> as the Masters. No, we got the Open. <laughs> we got the British <laughs> Open. We got the Players Championship. Yeah, sure. So much golf to talk about. Sure. So the Masters is now over. Will we even talk about golf until next April? That's a great question. The only way you can find out is to stay tuned uh, to this very program. How hey, At least golf has that going for it. Most people don't even care about the Daytona 500. That's true. That's true. It was a must-watch uh, Masters this weekend, especially yesterday as Scotty Scheffler just ran shop on everyone you and I, when Rob Brown were together watching Diesel yesterday, and if you like dominance, uh, you like yesterday's round three, Sunday's round, the final round, right? However, round oh, round four, sorry. Uh, if you liked dominance, you liked round four. If you didn't like dominance, you wanted something intriguing, Diesel, you did not get that yesterday because there was nothing really um, spicy that went into yesterday's round four matchups i mean scheffler really really did lead wire to wire yeah no big comebacks no. no pushes towards the end at least make it interesting he didn't crumble uh dechambeau didn't have a you know back nine heroic uh effort like we thought he would uh so it was just dominance it was absolute dominance yesterday from scotty scheffler and while we're bringing it back to Scheffler and the Masters, and I was half kidding, half not when I said that we've talked about golf for the one time of the year. Um, tongue in cheek, right? There's so many things to get to, Diesel, from yesterday's and this past weekend's Master Tournament because it is the one spectacle of the year that everybody does tune into. But yesterday, uh, I asked you, and I don't know if you heard me or not when I asked this question, but I asked uh, Rob Brown yesterday as we were watching this thing. I said, it really feels like we're in the Michael Jordan Washington Wizards era because mm. as Scotty, as good as Scotty Scheffler is, um, a big reason a lot of people still watch the Masters is to see what Tiger Woods is going to do, right? And he did not play well. He played well, what, round one, maybe? Round one and two were, were okay. Mm -hmm. Round four was okay. Round I mean, three, he, he though. Didn't play awfully in round four. Round three is where it just really fell off the wheels. What did you do, 87 or something? Yeah, it was not good. Not he, good at all. Uh, yeah, he, he really fell off in round three. And, and, and I have yet to hear anything from him that gives an explanation as to kind of really why well, that happened. He went 73, 72, 83, 77. So I mean, he, he was still, you know, he was still five over for round four, mm -hmm. which is not an awful round. It's not, it's not great. It's not going to win you the the thing anymore. Sure, but uh, you know that that round three eighty three was what. what well, you remember doing. before we get back to the Michael Jordan comparison, you remember last was it Friday when we talked about Tiger and I said, you know, he played really good round one, but when we get into Saturday Sunday, I, I was concerned yeah. about his health and you saw, I don't know if you saw the video or not. I saw the video of him having to rub his back and put a, the, the healing uh, ointment, whatever it may be, and almost pull his pants down and have him to, you know, get his hips and his, and his buttocks area, you know, because I mean, we laugh about it, but seriously, he's just not able to go that long. I, I think it just puts too much on his body. Is he allowed to, can anybody give us any insight on this? Are golfers allowed to do like cortisone injections? prior to rounds i would I, think I, so i would i would have to assume i mean that's probably you know looked at as a performance enhancer at that point if it's if it's essentially if you can numb your back so much that you don't feel it you think it's is that a performance would that be considered a it's, performance it's enhancer a pain reducer performance enhancer yeah i don't know it's a good question I, I though just, i just remember that scene in varsity blues when he busts into the locker room and you know the coach is ready to inject the running back in his knee with with the cortisone shot and he's like wendell don't get that shot. I actually have seen that movie, by the way. <laughs> I know usually most movies you like ask a, me about. There's like a one in ten chance if I make a movie. That's true. Cole's gotten it. So I want to go back to the question I asked yesterday, Diesel. I really do think that, and I don't know how much you followed Michael in the Washington era growing up, but you know, when when Michael got to the Washington Wizards era, he was all but done. You know. Yeah. He wasn't in his prime. He was there to be a mascot. Sure. A mascot and sell tickets. 
sell tickets, yeah. come out, like play Tim a little Tebow bit. in the NFL. Yeah. Um, but the, the whole thing behind Michael was in Washington, you could tell that the last dance, ironically, which came to be a, a Netflix series, you could tell, you you knew in Washington that the last dance uh, was over, that you had seen the last dance, right? That you knew in Washington that even though he's still playing, I don't think many people in the late 90s, early 2000s when he was in Washington, I don't think anybody Diesel at that point in his career still believed that he could go out and win a championship because he had left Chicago. No, not not unless he had been on like a LeBron type super team with, you know, with a handful of guys really who could carry, carry the team, it. who could go out there and win this thing. MJ could have gone out and put up, you know, 18, 20, 22 points. And I yeah. still would have, you know, been an admirable addition to a team that was out there winning title. And that's the way it would have happened in the modern era. You know, MJ would have said, I can pick and choose and go where I want to go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the team that gives me the best chance to keep, you know, earning rings. Yeah. I don't know who was dominant right then in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. At the time, I think I'm just thinking back. I was like, was it Houston? Houston, Maybe. Detroit. Um, yeah, Houston definitely was uh, starting to, to pick up, and um, Boston was as well. But I think it's very similar, Diesel, now with Tiger. Like, as much as everyone wants to see him, I don't know that anybody actually believes that he can still win a major. I mean, is there any way you could see Tiger winning another major in his career? No. I mean, not unless things just – insanely fell his way a major no a lesser tournament if he wanted to join it just because he knew that some of the big like you know if he knew that scotty scheffler wasn't going to be there and yeah he joins the tournament uh just because just so it's like ah, i get the thrill of victory again. maybe but even then i mean you know what what made tiger so good is that he was insanely consistent sure you know, he was out there shooting At a high level. four or five under every round mm -hmm. every week. And the consistency is completely shot at this point. Yeah, you're right. He There is no consistency to his game. I mean, for the, uh, what, round two that he shot really well, you know, in the 70s, that's a one-off at this point. And I hate it, Diesel. I really do because, boy, does the game need somebody like that. And we'll get into the second part of this question in a minute. But Cole, we need to pray for uh, our brother – Tolo JD. Why is that? In-laws are in town right now, <laughs> and uh, he's having to jump in and out, in and out of the stream. So we, we play, we pray for you, JD, with the in-laws. <laughs> Hopefully, you got get a good in-laws. I've got good in-laws. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> that is bad, man. That is bad. That is bad. All right, I do see that message now. Sorry about that, JD. Appreciate you uh, toloing. Turn it on. Leave it on. Uh, you can text the show seven one three zero seven. As long as you start your text with the word fan, because if you don't, we just won't see it, right? There's no way we'll see it. 71307. Again, start it with F A N. Uh, stream as well. Diesel's on Twitter at Diesel on Radio. I am on Twitter at D Cole Bryson. One Tolo chimed in and said on the text line Diesel, the Wizards were good for the most part when Jordan was there. They were bottom feeders before him. And then another texter says, We are all hopeful that 2005 Tigers showed up. But Again, that's uh, that tiger. Just like I think Michael was in Washington, I think that tiger's long gone, man. I, I just think it's very similar. Um, not only Diesel, the way their career is ending, but I think that Michael and Tiger Diesel are probably the only two athletes that you can compare. You know, like in terms of today's era to the older era, yeah. they both achieved tremendous heights and changed the sport um, not only because Tiger was a black golfer who absolutely just changed the game of golf but Michael who took the NBA by storm I think both of them were just um, probably the best ever at, at getting their sport to the top in terms of what Michael did for the NBA and what Tiger did for golf I don't know that we'll ever see another Tiger but I do think that uh, for the game of golf, now that I'll ask the second question, Diesel, they def definitely uh, need somebody. I guess you could argue that they desperately need someone to be the new face. And I asked the question, will Scheffler be the face? Because Spieth was supposed to be. He wasn't. Yeah. 
Um, who else? Justin Thomas was kind of supposed to be. He wasn't. Yeah. I think – well, first of all, to the to the previous texter's point, during MJ's seasons with the Wizards, 2001-2 and then 2002-2003, uh-huh. both seasons – they finished 37 and 45. So they were a f- sub 500 team both of those years. So I wouldn't quite say uh, they were decent those seasons, but even, even in those seasons, Michael averaged 23 points a game in 2001 and 20 points a game in 2002. So even then, MJ was putting up 20 points. It's just, you know. It didn't matter. No, it didn't matter anymore at that point. And look, golf needs golf needs big personalities. And uh, we're going to get into this a little bit later on. This is a fascinating, you know, spin on this question when it comes to our five o'clock fight. We're mm-hmm. going to talk about uh, boxing mm-hmm. in the five o'clock fight. We had a texter ask us uh, who did he think who do we think was going to win? This should be a five o'clock fight, uh, Mike Tyson or Jake Paul. And I don't think either one of us is going to choose Jake Paul. So I don't think that that's a fair question to ask us. I think where we're going to spin that is, are we into these spectacle fights? Sure. You know, these over the hill fighters fighting young guys who aren't really fighters, but you know, who are trying to make a name for themselves, which has become a big, which has become a big spectacle. And I, I, we need that. In, in sports to get anybody to watch anymore because our ability to watch anything at any time on any screen, anywhere we go has never been higher. You know, like no. you can sit and you can watch, you can watch, you know, high def tell live television on your phone on an airplane. Mm-hmm. Right. So like we are so fractured now with what we're able to watch and, you know, people, People don't really gather to watch sports the way that the way that they used to. So we need something that's going to make a bunch of people say, "Oh my god, yeah, oh my god, that's on!" Like you know, old hat boxer boxing fans aren't watching new boxing. No, new boxing fans don't really care that much about old boxers anymore. You so know, you don't so think Scheffler can be that I guy? Don't, I don't think he's got even remotely the personality for that. Hmm. I mean, he is a dud personality, and and. As a golfer, he's out of this world good. Yeah. I'm not taking anything away from from Scotty Scheffler as a golfer. I'm just saying he's kind of a boring dude. Yeah, he's not he's not flamboyant. No, he's not But that's um, what we need, right? To get people's attention anymore. Well, like, here's the like it, you're scro- let's say you're scrolling down Twitter mm-hmm. and and you see Scotty Scheffler, boring looking white dude in a pink shirt with a smidge of a dad bod. Are you stopping on that? Well, no. The issue not. is, to your point, the issue is for the golf. I think there's two separate conversations here, Diesel. For golf guy, Scheffler is good enough to be the face of golf sure. because you said it. He is just as dominant as any golfer that I've seen in the past several years. He, he, I mean, what he's been able to do in the last just few months has been incredible. Uh, what he did this past weekend was incredible. So for golf guy, I think they do believe that Scheffler is the face of golf now because he's won two of three masters. He can be the face of golf. This is something I said last week. He can be the face of golf inside golf, but he's not going to be the face of golf outside of golf. And Mad Craft says, when you think about it, Tiger didn't have much of an outgoing personality either. Mad Craft, that's true. However, we saw Tiger out there blowing the doors off the field. And then, you know, he was the guy who would drain a long putt and he would do the fist pump and he would get really flamboyant and he would really get the crowd whipped into a frenzy. Scotty Scheffler doesn't do that. So they've got not dissimilar personalities in the fact that they're both uh, more subdued. I think but a lot Tiger of Tiger had the ability to show the let the emotion out after he won. So I do agree with Madcraft's point to Tiger not being like the most flamboyant. I think a lot of it though, Diesel had to do when Tiger came on the scene in the late nineties, early two thousands. He was the first African American golfer sure. to be what he was. He was the first African American to ever win a Masters. Think about that. So not only was he great. He actually brought change to a sport. It was. It was a cultural phenomenon to a sport that was predominantly white. 
And Tiger won the first ever Masters as an African American in 1997. He was not only the first African American, he was also the youngest winner in that same Masters in 97 where he won by 12 strokes. So we had that audio a few weeks ago, and now I'm blanking on who it was. Uh, but they were talking about, he was talking about Caitlin Clark in Iowa. And he said, what's so fascinating about this might have been Kenny Smith. I don't know. I'll get it for you here in a second. Uh, but he said, what's so fascinating oh. about this is that she's a white girl yeah. doing this to a bunch of black girls. And that's what made it to him mm -hmm. compelling and interesting. Sure. Is watching this white girl who you would not expect to ball out the way that she does to absolutely demolish a team full of black girls. And that's what made it interesting and compelling to him. What made it what made Tiger interesting and compelling to a whole new generation of golf fans? A, he was young. B, he was insanely good. C, he was black. D, he was everywhere. I mean, Nike put him everywhere. Yeah. You're not seeing Scotty Scheffler out there the same way that they're putting Tiger out there. Well, and that's maybe a problem with, with how we try to market stars these days. It's it's almost like they're not trying to market the stars. I, I don't really understand. Like, why don't we see the world number one in tennis yeah on on cereal boxes on commercials on this on that whatever we don't that's paul pierce by the way right i believe I it was paul was. pierce that said was, that yeah. so diesel to your point i'll say this i agree with you in the sense of tiger transforming the sport and now that everyone who follows in that footstep tries to replicate what tiger did diesel I just don't know that we'll ever, 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 ever see a golfer that brings golf to the heights that Tiger brought golf to. Will there be a good golfer? Sure. Will there be another golfer that's the face of golf? Absolutely. But what Tiger did to the game of golf, I would bet money that as long as this world exists, You'll never see that again. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that you know until until a phenomenon comes along again. Yeah, which you you can't anticipate when a phenomenon is going to happen. Maybe Charlie, his son. Maybe. Maybe. May, I mean, yeah, but I mean, why why would Charlie Woods being a really good golfer be so compelling and interesting? Because he's Tiger's kid. Right? Sure. So I mean, I'm thinking about like they need this thing to be duos, rivalries that make us want to watch because. We're interested not only in what they're doing on the course, but off the course. I mean, think back a couple of years ago when Brooks Kepka and Bryson DeChambeau were getting into it, you know, throwing little jabs at each other. Sure. Well, now they're friends and it's like, eh, who cares anymore? Right. So I'll say this in terms of marketability before we hit a break to kind of put a bow on this. I do believe that NASCAR, and I'll get to this tweet that I put out yesterday. I do believe that NASCAR has areas where they are bringing viewership to the sport that has nothing to do, Diesel, with the sport itself. The drivers having podcasts. The drivers having beef between each other. I think that as good as the game of golf is with Scheffler being at the top, my point is I believe golf needs drama. Like it needs, you know how Denny Hamlin, we talk about it every time we have, a, a, we bring up NASCAR, everybody in the stream talks about how much they hate Denny Hamlin. Yeah. They golf needs the same thing. Golf needs the star in, in the game, right? Now. Sure, they need the Kim Mulkeys, right? They need the Angel Reese's. Golf needs storylines that have nothing to do with the play itself that creates energy, buzz, and a lot of uh, excitement about the game. And, and I don't think it has that. To your point about Scheffler, you're not going to get that from him. Uh, you're not going to get that really from anybody that I can think of right now, maybe from the live guys. I think. Rory has a touch of it, but Rory, you know, a lot of people don't really like Rory because he's a little sanctimonious at times. I mean, he has a little bit of that that fire in his personality, but Rory will also just fall off a cliff. Rory's know? not and consistent have, enough. No, he's not consistent enough. He can be good enough to play with the greats and be an elite level golfer, but he's he's inconsistent. And sure. I mean, like that makes him human. In that sense, it makes watching Rory a little more compelling. Yeah. But you know, I mean, he, he he doesn't have he doesn't have the tiger in him no. to go out and be that good. If he was that good, I think he'd be very potentially a, a, a face of the game. One texter says, "I think what y'all are saying is a person that commands the room, tiger. Excuse me, 
Tiger walked into a room and it was his. Well, like, I do agree with that a little bit, Texter. I, I, I hear you. I would say that Scheffler in his prime right now would still, in a sense, command the room. But my biggest point is I think there's so much to be said about Tiger transforming the game with being the first African-American to do this and transform the sport. I don't know that you'll ever see someone be able to transform the sport again. You know, and, and Yeah, it's – you, when you're when you're looking for and trying to predict a paradigm shift, yeah, you're gonna miss time and time and time again. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, we're gonna get a little bit deeper into Tiger's awful third round and just his overall performance at this year's Masters. Next, we're also gonna power rank the best ways to actually watch sports. What are your best ways? What are your favorite ways? Your top four ways to watch sports. We'll do that next here on Wire to Wire. I'm Diesel. He's Cole Bryson. We are the Fan Up State. Join us next Thursday. We'll be live 
at Dave & Buster's Woodruff Road in Greenville for our day one NFL draft coverage. What do you want to know about your teams? Well, guess what? We're going to be there talking about all of it for four straight hours. Dave & Buster's Woodruff Road in Greenville. I can already tell you that we will have Anish Shroff, the play-by-play voice of the Carolina Panthers, on the show. We'll be talking about what the Panthers will do. Not that day because Carolina I was gonna Panthers say. don't have a first-round pick, but we're not going to be at Dave & Buster's for the second-round pick. Second round. So we'll just be there for the first round. And we'll do a little. I mean, you guys will figure it out, right? It'll be fun, man. Yeah, it will be. It will be. Uh, I'm Diesel. He is Cole Bryce. And this is Wire to Wire, a brand new show here on the Fan Upstate. We love your participation. We want you texting the show, 71307. Start your text with keyword fan. We want you calling the show on the renewal by Anderson of the Carolinas fan phone. That's 844. 844- Three two six three six six three. We want you Tolos in the chat on the live stream. We have it on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. Just search for the Fan Upstate. It's on Cole Bryson's Twitter. That's at the Cole Bryson, and on my Twitter at Diesel on Radio. But Cole, you said earlier you mentioned it. You let the cat out of the bag. I don't know if Rob did or earlier today, or if, if you're the first one that's unveiled that we are all actually friends off the air. Like we we talk to each that's other, we text each other off the show. You're like, I was worried about that. You didn't know. Like, I mean, I'm texting <laughs> with these guys, but I'm pretty sure we might be. <laughs> uh, no, we were all hanging out yesterday at Rob Brown's house. Um, he and his fiance put out just a fantastic spread, man. We had all of the masters, OGs, and favorites. We had egg salad sandwiches. We had uh, pimento cheese sandwiches, two types. We had we had uh, Rob's pimento cheese sandwiches, and we had Cole's pimento cheese sandwiches. You guys can ask me on the chat which I liked better. One was homemade, one was not. I will reveal <laughs> whose pimento cheese sandwiches were better if you ask me to do it on the chat, okay? I need you to go over there and do that. Uh, we had uh, some uh, some homemade, home-mixed azaleas. Rob Brown spared no expense. He got out the vodka. He got out the pineapple juice and the grenadine, and he made some azaleas. We had ourselves a good time. Great time. We had ourselves really a really was good, a good time, time watching the final round of the Masters, even though, as you said it, the final round was not all that compelling. I nope. mean, there were no major runs. There were no major collapses. Scotty Scheffler did what Scotty Scheffler does, and he went out there and he he won the Masters uh, pretty easily. But what are your uh, favorite ways to watch sports nowadays? We, we, we talked about it earlier. We're so fractured with the way we consume content, with the way we consume media. A lot of people won't even watch things live. They only want to watch the, like, 30-second Twitter clips of NBA games and they're like, yeah, I've got enough. I, that's all I really care about. Yeah, LeBron dunked the ball over somebody about his height. Cool. That's that's the game from last night. But what are your power? If you had a power rank, Cole, mm-hmm. the best ways to watch sports. What is your favorite way to do it? And I think it's I think it's pretty simple here. Okay, it's pretty easy for me. Number four. Is like being in public somewhere, gathering at a bar yeah. to watch a sporting event. Like you go to the bar and it's like th- there's a crowd of people and everything's going to be really expensive because you're out at a bar, right? You yeah. have to fight to get a table, first of all. Like if it's a big like UFC or something, if you don't get there like five hours in advance, you ain't getting a table. And then you're going to be paying a ton of money for for table or for uh, for drinks and you're going to have people mad at you because you've been camped out in the same t- chair for the last five hours. And it's just like the, the, the worst way in my mind to go out and watch live sports. Okay. Number four on my list, or excuse me, number three on my list is a group setting like we had yesterday. And that's no disrespect to you guys, to Rob Brown. This is just my own personal power ranking here. Yeah. But, a, but a group setting like that, you still got to gather things together. You got to drive somewhere. You know, you got to you gotta spend a little extra money if you're hosting the event, which, again, Rob and, and Courtney did a, did a fantastic job of. But it's it's not as good as you know, just doing it at home, where alone, where things are paid for. I like doing it that way. And the number one, obviously, is being at the stadium. If I'm going to if I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to spend money, I want to be there. So power ranking ways for me to watch live sports. Number one is being there in the stadium. Number two is at home alone on my couch where everything's already paid for. Number three is setting up a watch party like we did yesterday. Number four is, you know, public, like at a bar. So I think this is really intriguing and I'm really torn on my rankings. Being in a stadium for the most part, I would agree with is number one. However, 
I don't know, man. Like my tune might have changed in the last few years, especially with the NFL. I love being at home and during a commercial break. I don't have to sit in a stadium and watch nothing for six minutes. It feels like I can get up. I can go get something to eat. I can use the bathroom. I can do whatever I want. I love being in the stadium and being there, Diesel, being present. However, man, I don't know. Sometimes sometimes I believe at home can be just as good in front of your own 85-inch you you TV. You can get the same rush of, from an 85-inch TV Yeah, when, when your team catches a 40-yard pass for a touchdown. So as you do in this, I don't buy it. I'm weird. I don't buy I, it. Well, I'm weird. On, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll bring the Cowboys into this. Well, not a whole lot of those 40-yard touchdown passes. No. So take that back. But I prefer to watch them alone a lot of times because I do get emotionally invested. And I do I, I do not like being in a group setting. I don't know. This may be something that's me, uh, a me thing. It may be a trend. But I don't like being in a group setting when I'm nervous. Like, the, the Cowboy Games Diesel are probably the only games nowadays that I actually get like nervous for. Yeah. And like I'm, I'm during the game, I'm not really happy and I'm not really wanting to talk to a lot of people because I'm most of the time I'm, I'm pissed off, right? Because it's, it's the Cowboys. But I think me being home alone for whatever reason, watching Cowboys games is where I, I, I feel most comfortable because I can get mad. I can say things I shouldn't uh, because that happens a lot with Dallas. But being in a stadium, yeah, it's great because you're there with your fans. I will say to the stadium rank, uh, stadium being number one, the only way it's number one on my list is if it's your team. Not like going to, I don't want to say a local team's name, but if you just go to a public, uh, well, let's say a baseball you go to a game. game that you don't care about the team. Well, games have turned into social events. Yeah, but you're going there because it's your so you're being social with your team. So I'm I, I'm just taking the assumption of or the possibility of you going to a a neutral game for you, yeah, Not a neutral site game, just a neutral game for you. I know you're a Cowboys fan, but let's just say uh, that um, the Seahawks were playing the Browns. Like I wouldn't expect you to even go to that game. No, I'm with you. So I will I will agree that being in the stadium is number one. I would say that. I would switch out three and four on your list. I do love being in a big public setting. Like I love having a ton of people around watching really? a game. Yeah, I love it. Okay, okay. Yep. Adcraft smacking you around a little bit on the text line. What do you say? In the chat, he says, uh, he says that's not the reason at all. It's because everyone trash talks the Cowboys. Well, that probably Cole doesn't like it. That might have a little bit to do with Madcraft it. Madcraft also says his number one way to go watch sports is at home on his couch in the nude. Appreciate that. We really that appreciate crap. that. That's that's really gross. I like I like big settings. I don't know if it's necessarily being in a bar, but like I like uh, you know venues around the upstate that have yeah big big TVs. I love watching sports in a public setting. I'll go, I'll, I'll go to any of these. I'm, sure. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just want to be very clear. I'm not that curmudgeon who's saying no. I won't go watch something in the in a public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Like I went down uh, last year uh, to Yeehaw Brewing to watch. Furman versus San Diego State. Now it didn't turn out very well for Furman mm -hmm. in that game, but I, it was great. It, well, watching the game among people was great, but like figuring out how to get a beer when the line is forty. No, oh, I get that. That part sucked. Ninety percent really sucked. Ninety percent of the time, Diesel being with people is better than watching it alone. So that's where my rankings would be different. However. There are games like when Dallas is in the playoffs, the few times they are, I don't like being around a lot of people. I just don't. So I, I question here, Cole, I, are we losing in some ways the social element of getting together and watching sports? Like the 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 PVP face-to-face -face element of watching sports. I mean, Madcraft here says that he likes to watch games at home. You said you love to watch games at home. I say I really love to watch games at home. I mean, we're getting to that point where we don't really – have to see anyone face to face. You're right, though. Anymore, I mean, we don't do it with with video games. Uh, we uh, we um, have an audio clip here that I want to play. Wanna, wanna, um, hang on one second. Let me mute this website. Boom. There we go. Um, I mean, 
the cable guy predicted it in the late 1990s. You'll be able to play Mortal Kombat with a friend in Vietnam. Yeah, we just play video games with our friends online. We were there at the party yesterday, uh, the gathering yesterday, and people were talking. It's like, yeah, I got my friends in, in England that I play video games with. Well, okay. I mean, we, we, we're... We're not really making face-to-face -face connection friendships the way I we think, used to. As a society, not all people, but as a society. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact of it being such a hassle to go to a game, especially if you have a big family. Like, for example, yeah. a buddy of mine texted me, uh, Big Tony is what I call him. Big Tony does not – he's a diehard South Carolina fan. Don't mess with Big Tony or you will end up with – It sounds like – yeah, I was going to say, it sounds a, like an Italian mobster, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? So Tony is a huge buddy of mine, is a huge South Carolina fan. He just texted me about this topic we're talking about. He is one of the biggest South Carolina football fans that I know. However, during the fall, he, I, and others would rather sit at his house mm. and watch it at the pool or whatever where we can go inside and get something to eat, go inside and get something to drink, use the bathroom, and then when the game's over, guess what? We're not having to drive an hour and a half home. We're not having to spend a lot of money. You said it. At home, you're not having to do much. Obviously, you might order food or something or cook out, but there's something about the easiness, and uh, mm. I, I don't know. So I don't, that's where I'm the opposite. I, I To me, being in the stadium, watching it happen, makes all of the other garbage that you have to put up with worth it. You think so? Yeah. I mean, assuming you can afford it. like Assuming you're not like putting yourself in debt to go to a Clemson game or a South Carolina game because it can happen. Tickets are Freaking expensive. Sure. Gas is expensive. Parking is expensive. You want to get, you know, just enough food and beverage to sustain you while you're inside, not even getting hammered or, or getting stuffed on food while you're in there. That's going to cost you a lot of money. But to me, like being there, seeing it face to face, feeling that roar of the crowd, like it makes the crappy bathroom lines worth it. It makes having to fork out 20 bucks or, or walk a long way. It makes it worth it to me. I don't like leaving a stadium. Well, let me back up. Feeling broke? Well, <laughs> well, no, not necessarily that, but I'm just saying, like, I, I agree. With, this is such a tough debate. It's such a tough power ranking because I hear you. I feel the same way you feel, but there's I don't know why. There's just so many times where I think to myself, oh, it would be a great weekend to go see Atlanta, like go see the Braves. Yeah. However, I also think to myself, while it would be fun, I know that it's a 7 o'clock first pitch, like next Sunday, Braves, Rangers, Sunday night baseball, be a great game. 7 o'clock pitch, however, 8, 9, 10, game's over 10.30. You're not getting home till 1 a.m., 1.30. Yeah. So, it's a brutal drive. It is. I've gone, gone down to Atlanta many, many times for concerts that don't get out till 11 o'clock at night, and that drive home sucks. It does. Or you got to fork out the money to get a hotel in Atlanta. That that's what I'm saying. Too. So that's the hard part. I think I, I think it's a tough debate because I like being there with you. Like you said, I like being in the crowd in Te the moment. Texter says, just wait until we have VR in home. It can have the best of both worlds. See, Texter, that sounds awful to me. Putting on like a heavy plastic headset on just to feel like I'm. No, that sounds awful to me. But that's just me. A ton of takes coming in. We'll get to those on the other side. Phone lines open as well, 71307. I saw something over the weekend that I wanted to get to in this very next segment, and it is especially geared toward Atlanta Braves fans. I have a side-by-side -side comparison. 621 games in of Austin Riley compared to arguably the best Brave to ever do it, Chipper Jones. This is a very interesting comparison. Where does Austin Riley stack up against Chipper? And my question is, will he ever even be in the same conversation as Chipper? Next, he's Diesel. I'm Cole Bryson, and this is the Fan Upstate.
All right, Atlanta Braves fans, you did get two of three this weekend. However, things got hairy yesterday as Diesel and I and Rob Brown were watching the Braves lose the series until Marcelo Zuna came in clutch. And the uh, audio of what that sounds like. Oh, yeah, let's hear that first. Runners go. Ozuna hits it in the air to left center. Chisholm back. It's gone! The Big Bear with a big fly! The Braves down to their final strike. And Ozuna, who owns Miami, strikes again. Man, y'all are like, this team sucks. This team's falling apart. We're gonna we're gonna be awful this year. And we then screaming like little they girls. Can't do anything. <laughs> and, and you guys, uh, both of you. I I couldn't see the screen. I only caught like a little sliver out of it. That's the audio we need. And y'all were losing it. We did lose God, it. I wish I had video. Of that. <laughs> so y'all were like, I know you haven't seen it. Major League. Y'all were like the three dudes in the outfield who were like, when they go to the games, but they hate the team. They know they're going to fall apart. All they do is trash talk. It really them. is. That is that exactly. That was you two. To a it really is. So I was upset. So I saw this tweet over the weekend. I wanted to bring it to the program because it is very interesting. As good as Austin Riley has been for Atlanta, I don't know if you, our listener, uh, if you are a Braves fan, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but it's a side-by-side -side comparison of Austin Riley versus Chipper Jones. I think for the majority, Diesel, the majority of Braves fans, Chipper is always going to be their guy. Even That's for, the one my sister had a crush on growing up. Sure. Like every woman in the every, South had a crush on Chipper. Jones. Right. And every guy, I, I think that's a Braves fan, will always say Chipper is their favorite player ever, for the most part. Man crush. Sure. However, this side-by-side -side comparison is super interesting. So this is Austin Riley, 621 games in compared to Chipper Jones, 622 games in. So at the same point of their career, their stats are not as far off as you might think. <laughs> Matt Kraft says even he had a crush on Chipper Jones. Thank you for admitting that, Matt Kraft. So We also found out that he watches sports naked on his couch. Yeah, I didn't need to know that either today. Yeah. You're, Chipper you're Jones. Two today, <laughs> Chipper Jones at this point in his career, 622 <laughs> games in. Chipper had 690 hits. Austin Riley, not far behind him, 647 hits. Home run category, Chipper at this point in his career, uh, 622 games in. Chipper Jones had 108 home runs. At this point in Austin Riley's career, he has 136 home runs. So significantly more home runs than Chipper had. As far as RBIs go, Chipper did have a few more RBIs. 20 or 30, uh, 30 or 40 more RBIs than Austin Riley does at this point. Their batting average was pretty close. Chipper, 297 compared to Austin Riley, 275. And then slugging percentage, Austin Riley had Chipper uh, 621 games in with a 509 slugging compared to Chipper's 504. So even though they both had one championship, 621 games in, Chipper had three All-Stars, Austin has two. Austin has two silver sluggers. Chipper had zero. Chipper is in the Hall of Fame. Chipper's one of the best Braves ever. One of the best players in the MLB ever. I want to know from Braves fans if Austin Riley will ever be in the same conversation as Chipper. Because in baseball, that's hard. Because baseball people are, they're a breed unto themselves. They are. They are. I mean, like, I love baseball. But some of y'all, like you take you take some of these stats so deep to heart that they'll never be unseated. Mm -hmm. They'll never your mind will never be changed. Even when you see things like the, the raw numbers, yeah, that tell you, oh, well, it's because of this. Oh, it's because it's just like, why can't you just recognize greatness anytime you're seeing greatness? And 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 part of it may be because Cole, we're just used to seeing so much more. Of this you seven know, one, so much more highlights. We're seeing so much more footage, so much more coverage that you know it's it's almost become normalized to be great. And so to to get anybody's attention, you have to be out of this world great. 
Let us know if you are a Braves fan. Let us know where you weigh in on this because I think it is interesting to see in terms of if Austin will ever get the same credit that Chipper got. Again, Chipper had a phenomenal career. Um, Austin's a heck of a player. 71307 is the number you can text in. 71307. Start your message with the word fan. Phone lines 844 fan phone. That's 844 326 3663. I mean, these numbers are are not, they're not very different. No, they're not. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking the difference of, of, you know, a 60 plate appearances. We're talking the difference of 40 hits, over 600 games. Yeah. These guys are virtually equal as players. A couple of uh, messages on the stream. Trey says, I don't care what anyone says. Hank Aaron is still the home run king. Madcraft says Chipper was the guy on the team. Riley can't be on a team with Acuna, Olsen, Always, Harris. As far as the numbers, Riley could absolutely match Chipper. I think that's a good point, Madcraft, because the, the, the talent around Austin Riley, and let's see if I get any pushback on this, the, t- the talent around Austin Riley is far superior than the talent that was around Chipper Jones. I think it was far superior. Chipper had good teams. Chipper was on a lot of good teams. But I do agree with you, Madcraft, in saying that Chipper was the guy because um, for a lot of Braves fans, they became Braves fans because of Chipper. There wasn't – the, the uh, Acunas, there wasn't the Olsons. You're right. I, I think it has a lot to do with that. However, man, it's interesting to see them both at 600 and, what, 20 games in, how their stats, as Diesel said, are so similar. It, it, it's crazy. We're talking about Austin Riley and maybe one of the best Braves to ever do it, 621 games in. They're not far off, which is just mind-boggling. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, Austin still has a, a a really long career ahead of him. One texter says, Austin is great with the leather, but it's not as smooth as Chipper. Compare strikeouts, says Rev Red. We appreciate the text at 71307. I don't know. There's still a lot to be said to Austin Riley's career. I, I just kind of to your point, Diesel, Chipper Jones, to most Braves fans, is going to be the guy forever. He's yeah. going to be the the fan favorite he for was, a long time. Unless you're, unless you're uh, just a fan of pitching. And then one of those 90s pitchers, Smoltz, True. Avery, Glavin, Maddox, one of those guys is going to be your guy. If not, it's I always had a I always had a soft spot in my heart, though, for Fred McGriff. I yeah. love Fred, the crime dog, and he was my guy. Yeah. I, lo- I love Fred McGriff growing up as a kid. That's probably Fred McGriff was probably the reason why I wanted to be a first baseman. So there's just, a lot of good ones. Yeah. But Chipper was, man, he we, was. I think we all need to just get better at recognizing greatness in front of it and appreciating greatness when we see it sure you know we we see so much greatness now that we're all kind of just like yeah ho-hum no big deal speaking of greatness he's won multiple super bowls but he's out there acting like a damn fool travis kelsey is what he did okay or was it a step too far we'll get to that next here on wire to wire on the fan up state
Cole, you can't turn on the news these days or turn on uh, anything on, on your phone. You can't watch any video without seeing an ad for two things. DraftKings mm -hmm. or the filthy water at Camp Lejeune. I still right? need to call about All that. All these ads about this. You just want to see if maybe you got money <laughs> stashed away that you didn't realize. Uh, uh, we'll get into the Jason Kelsey, Travis Kelsey thing here, here in just a second. But this made, me, this made me laugh, man. John Wayne Bobbitt, who a lot of our audience knows who he is, whose ex-wife infamously cut off his little John Wayne has lost all of his toes as a result of the contaminated water at Camp Lejeune. This is in the news. He lost, I guess he just lost his last toe. He had he had uh, nine of them missing. One of them was still hanging on. Mm. Well, that very last toe fell off. He was diagnosed with toxic peripheral polyneuropathy after being exposed to the contaminated water at Camp Lejeune. And you're like, is this really a thing? Like, why are we seeing these ads so much? It's guys like John Wayne Bobbitt, who is a Marine who served this country. He probably got paid bank, though, right? I guess. I mean. Would you rather have 10 toes or make a huge profit off a lawsuit? Because take my know, toes. Oh, man. Like, you can't take the big toe because that's the balanced toe. Is right? it? Yeah. Just just imagine. Just imagine standing there for a second without your big toe. <laughs> just imagine having $8 million in your bank account. <laughs> 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 yeah, but he also he also lost his little thingy too. So he's he's. Ooh. I don't know if there's anybody in this world more famous for things falling off than John Wayne Bobby. That water man, it really got him. Yeah, that's some. That's what are you doing? Would you, like, you just dip your toes in this like sewage water? How would did it, this happen? Would it be bad of, of us if we have or create diesel an ongoing list of people? We can put like on the wall with a poster board or one of those uh, sticky papers of people that we wish would have went to Camp Lejeune. <laughs> Is that bad? O. Should J. I not say that? Aaron Hernandez. <laughs> um, send them. Send them to Lejeune list. <laughs> yeah, John Rom for defecting for saying I'll never leave. I love it here. And then what does he do? Goes to live. Splits her live. Uh, speaking of of you know cutting people off, but things falling off. Jason Kelsey has had to cut people off on the internet over the last few days uh, because he's getting getting bombarded with people on social media asking him to do something about his brother Travis. This was a this was a tweet sent directly to Jason Kelsey. Of course, like I, pe people. I don't know why people think they can still get away with sending like horrible uh, DMs to women and them not exposing it. Sure. Like, that's the first thing I would do. That's yeah. the first thing I would do. If somebody sent me something truly awful, if I was a woman and I was getting all these horrible, nasty sexual text messages and photos, I would screenshot that mess and I would put it on the internet for all to see. Let's expose that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't have to suffer with this. Let's expose that guy. Anyway, uh, Jason Kelsey's getting getting DMs and he's getting uh, tweets sent at him. So he retweets this uh, with a with personal X tweeted, "Doing what you did at a playoff game in Buffalo is one thing, but doing that at the college where he Travis got kicked off the team for acting like a jackass probably wasn't the best idea." If you if you don't know what I'm talking about here, uh, Jason was videoed shotgunning a beer. Or excuse me. Uh, Travis, Travis was videoed shotgunning a beer mm -hmm. at the University of Cincinnati, where they were hosting a um, an impromptu diploma ceremony, cap and gown, the whole thing. Travis accepted his diploma, then he cracked open a beer and chugged a beer. I don't know how you feel about this. First of all, I got to be real with you. It wasn't real. I mean, the beer was real. The cap was real. The gown was real. They were really at the University of Cincinnati. I assume that it was the real chancellor, whoever at Cincinnati does the diploma things. Mm -hmm. But it was all a ruse, okay? It was all a sketch for their New Heights podcast, which the new episode, um, I don't know when exactly this new episode is going to come out. But they taped it a couple days ago, four days ago in Cincinnati for their New Heights podcast. 
And Jason's out there defending the behavior saying, quote, I know it looks like a graduation from the video, but this was actually at the end of a New Heights live podcast that we put on to raise money for the University of Cincinnati's NIL. The university did this to poke fun at my brother and I, uh, and I for one, and I for never really picking up, uh, oh, poking fun at my brother and I for not really picking up our diplomas. So at first, a lot of the internet lost their minds because they were like, oh my God, Travis Kelsey, you're finally getting your diploma. What are you doing? You look like a jackass. But now I turn this all around and say, it's the University of Cincinnati the hell is wrong with you participating in an event like this, a fake graduation where you got somebody chugging a beer who you kicked off the team who never got his diploma. I think this is a really bad look for the university of Cincinnati. Well, the way, the way I look at it is Cincinnati is irrelevant. They're irrelevant in everything that they do. I don't know. You should have done that while I was drinking. Well, I'm sorry. They are irrelevant. (laughs) And as much as, as much as I, and got, curb stomped. I was there in person. It was not close. Um, as much as, Hey, they were there though. They were there as much as I dislike five programs who have never gotten there talking trash about Cincinnati for getting there and getting blown out when blown out blowouts happen all the time in the college football playoff. So as much as I dislike the two Kelsey brothers, I like, I would like to add them to the camp Lejeune list, but to me, I'm just over both of them. And on the on the topic of Cincinnati, I think they you know I think they look at it as an opportunity to to get a little PR, get a little PR, and and you know their Who's guys a went there. Right now, the Kelsey brothers and the Paul brothers. I would. Ah, I'm used to the Paul brothers at this point. I think the Paul brothers are more annoying because they're just bigger, you know, douchers. I don't know, man. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm sick. If we never heard the word Kelsey again, I'd be happy. I don't know why. I'm just over him. I'm over Travis. I'm over Jason. Like, I just, yeah, they have a little cute podcast. It's all fine and dandy, but I don't know, man. I'm just over both of them. I saw the New Heights podcast they were doing live from um, Cincinnati, and I think Joe Burrow was on it, and they had some other big guests. But to me, man, it's just, I don't know. They have both, to me, created themselves caricatures of themselves they ha- they're, they're yeah. just they're just goofy and you know a lot of people love it but to, to me i'm over it yeah i don't i don't understand why a university as prestigious as prestigious as cincinnati and i'm sure they're high up there tippy top top of the educational world mm-hmm. would allow something like because you know truthfully most universities are uh kind of boring like sure fuddy duddies sticks in the mud you're not going to, you know, you're not going to drag our names through it just for a laugh on your podcast. You know, we're not going to allow that to happen. So I'm disappointed in Cincinnati for allowing this. I really am. Uh, Madcraft says, uh, number one, uh, why do they think Jason has any control over Travis? He's not his freaking dad. Which is true. To grow up. That is very true. But I mean, they are, they, they have turned from football players into clowns for clicks. Yeah. Right. Uh, he says, did you compare two Super Bowl champions to to YouTube losers? Yeah, Madcraft, that's exactly what we're comparing. They to. can still be Super Bowl champions, but like I, I've never liked Jason because he played for Philadelphia. And then Travis, to me. But it's crazy that we have you on tape saying that if the Cowboys don't <laughs> win at all, you'll go be a Philly fan. That's, that is uh, the AI call. The no, AI call. totally real. That's, I, I believe <laughs> it, honestly. I, I don't know, man. I just. I'm over both of them. I really am. I, it, it's 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 crazy how big podcasters have gotten, right? They're, sure. they're, they're massive stars. So, so shout out to them. Hey, we didn't really have a chance to finish this earlier in the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, we wanted to come back around to it. Uh, we were talking the Masters in the very first segment. We were talking Tiger Woods and, you know, as Tiger entering his uh, MJ with the Wizards element time of his career uh, we were talking about just how bad tiger played in the masters this year as bad as he played cole he has now entered a new class he has broken a record he broke the record for uh, consecutive cuts at the masters he broke his tie uh, between uh, himself gary player and fred couples 
Gary Player made the Masters cut every year from 1959 to 1982. Fred Couples every year from 83 to 2007. Tiger just broke that record, broke that tie with his 24th straight cut. Shout out to him. Um, But uh, that's not the only record that he broke at the Masters there, Cole. He also broke the record for his streak of days of not putting anybody in the infirmary. Mm. Because on Friday... He hit a shot out of the trees. We talked about, you know, uh, his his awful third round. He had uh, some rough go of it a little bit in the second round as well. Friday, he he went out of the trees, and he clocked a fan with the golf ball. So his his streak, you know, those those number of days without an accident posters. Uh, he had to hit the reset button on that. He was at three years, one month, and twenty days from the time that he put himself in the hospital with the car crash. Uh, but he hit a fan in the head with a golf ball. And he put somebody back in the infirmary. That's so not what you want. Tiger Woods for doing that. Um, he did finish. Ugh, just just how bad Tiger's round was. He finished last among players who made the cut. Dead last. He also finished with the his highest score ever as a pro, which was a sixteen over three oh four. His previous worst was in twenty fifteen where he shot a total of a 302. Wow. So not bad. Four rounds of the Masters, <laughs> 73, 72, 83 and 77. Not bad for your average golfer. No, I mean I would I would be <laughs> stoked. My best round ever. And like, you know, when I get out on the course, I I cheat a little bit. I, I cheat a lot, okay? I cheat a lot when I play golf. But like I don't play golf for money, so like I you know, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to get into the game like really. Yeah get better and like it doesn't do me any good at this point to hit off the dirt when the ball goes off the fairway i'm not going to hit off the dirt i'm not going to hit off rocks or gravel because i do hit it off the fairway quite a bit but we'll bring it back out on the fringe and i'm going to hit out of grass because i also don't want to wreck my clubs but it's neither here nor there tiger uh, did say that he plans to play uh, a couple more majors this year he plans to play at the PGA Championship at Pinehurst in May, the U.S. Open in June at Valhalla, and the British Open at Troon in July. He said, quote, coming in here, not having played a full tournament in a very long time, it was a good fight on Thursday and Friday. Unfortunately, Saturday didn't quite turn out the way that I wanted it to. Mm. Really, Tiger? Not quite the way that you wanted to. He also said, quote, I'm just going to keep lifting, keep the motor going, keep the body moving, keep getting stronger, keep progressing. Hopefully the practice sessions will keep getting longer. He didn't say anything about not having sex anymore because he, he, Tiger never said this. A lot of people are putting this in Tiger's mouth. Tiger never once said, I'm abstaining for sex for the masters. But his friend said that Tiger was abstaining from sex. So like, if you're Tiger Woods, you're 50, what is he, 53 years old? Is he that old? Years old? I think. Yeah, somewhere around in there. 52, 50. If you're 52, 53 years old, and I told you that you could abstain from sex and you will get one more major at an undisclosed time of your career, before you eventually officially retire, you will get one more major. If you're that level of competitor, would you do it? Would would I think I think better question is you'd say you'd say yes, but could you do it? I would not see him doing it. No, no, no I mean, way, no he's shot. Bordering on an addict. Yeah, there's no shot. No shot. No shot. Tiger does it. Um, a little bit of breaking news locally. Diesel. I've had three text messages in the last uh, three text messages in the last ten minutes about this. Cam Scott, very interesting school, uh, very interesting story potentially brewing in South Carolina's favor. I don't know if it will or not, but we have a little breaking news. So Cam Scott, 2024 guard out of Lexington High School in Columbia, one of the best basketball players I've ever seen with my eyes, right? I saw him in a state championship against Burns. Cam Scott was committed to Texas. However, today, not long ago, Diesel, Cam Scott has been granted his full release from his national letter of intent that he signed with Texas in November. 
He has announced his decommitment from the program. Scott, a native of Lexington, South Carolina, can now reopen the recruitment process. Here's where it gets interesting. Cam Scott was a player highly coveted by the Gamecocks and second-year coach Lamont Paris. Six-foot-six shooting guard. Um, he, I believe he committed right before Lamont really got started at South Carolina, so I don't know that he had the best relationship with Lamont Paris. They weren't pretty enough for him yet. Not yet. So Texas was the ultimately the school that won Scott out. However, all of a sudden, things have changed. He chose Texas over South Carolina, Auburn, Alabama, Florida State, Ole Miss, and Oregon. He was the Gatorade Player of the Year. Um, and John Whittle from the Big Spur has reported that uh, four, four-star guard Cam Scott's officially back on the market. He had his full release from his NIL signed on Monday morning. He has announced his decommitment on social medias effectively today at 2 o'clock. Is there anything, though, that points to him choosing South Carolina among those schools that have already that, that are already well, offered him? Well, Whittle says, John Whittle, John Whittle is reporting that South Carolina certainly wants for Scott to stay home and play for the Gamecocks. He's visited everywhere. He's needed in he's needed to in the past, and it's just about reconnecting with the coaches, says John Whittle. With some are not far away and portal recruiting being of chief importance, timing should move quickly for Scott. Whittle goes on to say, uh, if Scott lands at South Carolina, it shouldn't be lost that the Gamecocks will have signed the top player in the state in each of Lamont Paris's three years with the program, G.G. Jackson, Colin Murray Boyles, um, and then potentially now Cam Scott. Uh, nothing definite pointing yet, but Ooh. boy, yeah, that could be absolutely huge for the Gamecocks. That's the Gamecocks planting their flag oh, man. in this state. That's them building a wall around this state and saying, we will do whatever it takes. Now, look, we're not stupid here. This, this, a lot of this has to do with NIL. Sure. Uh, the University of South Carolina is showing that they are serious about it and they are willing to spend the money to get there. Well, I'll tell you this. Lamont Paris right now <laughs> is probably in communication with Scott, with Cam Scott. I, I, I don't see any way he's not. Um, this could be, again, he's been offered from everybody and their mother, but this is a kid that's been committed, uh, committed to Texas since November. If somehow, some way, Diesel South Carolina could land this guy, that would be just it'd be it'd be huge. It would be monstrous, as you said. They'd be planting the flag. I don't know where he's going to go, but boy, oh boy, could this thing now that all of a sudden he's from Lexington, he's in South Carolina's backyard. Man, it. I'm not saying South Carolina's the favorite, but boy, does Lamont Paris now have an advantage? How many more years of NCAA tournaments and? Deep runs, sweet 16s, elite eights, et cetera. Would it take for South Carolina Gamecock football fans to finally admit, no, 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 we're a, we're a basketball school? I'm getting another text in at the moment that says, originally South Carolina was Scott's second choice behind Texas. So if that's true, interesting. if that's still the case, man, can you imagine? I mean, Lamont Paris um, the, is, is new – as he is on the scene. Who's the bag man? That's what I want to know. Who's throwing the bag? Wasn't it funny that like NIL, we, we were supposed to get all this stuff above the table. We were sure. supposed to know who the bag man was on all this stuff. Not like the old school days with the $500 handshakes yeah. and the, you know, the Corvette in the driveway. We didn't know who was dropping that stuff off. Mm -hmm. Like this was supposed to bring all of this to the forefront. Now it's just even shadier than it ever was. Well, I think for Cam Scott's perspective, you know, I know Texas had a, a shooting forward leave the uh, – a small forward or a guard just recently leave and enter the portal, but I don't know exactly what his reasoning was. His statement on Twitter that he put out, Diesel, did not lead to any um, hint of where he may go. He did say with private family matters and long thought-out conversations with my family, I have requested release from my NIL with the University of Texas. And will be <laughs> in LI. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're easy to get confused. Uh, maybe both, though, you know, <laughs> in LI with his national letter of intent. Uh, and we'll be looking, says Cam Scott, to stay closer to my loved ones as I pursue their next, the next steps. Did you hear that? Oh, 
He wants it, to be near his mama. He says, I will be looking to stay closer to my loved ones. Special thanks to Coach Rodney Terry and staff for being transparent with me throughout the process. Well, how much closer to his loved ones can he get than Columbia? I I don't know if you can read into a statement, Diesel, but when he says he wants to be close to his loved ones, that, that to me that that's a that's a hint. Lamont yeah. Paris could be on on uh, I mean, on the edge. He's not that far away. It's not, but Columbia is a lot, you know, it, <laughs> it is a lot closer than Tallahassee. Huge for South Carolina. Oh, my word. Yeah, Trey Davis, or no, not Trey Davis, sorry, just Trey, said, what's wrong with wanting to be both uh, both and an equestrian school? What's he mean? Help uh, me out South there. South Carolina won some, some equestrian competitions. I don't even think it's NCAA. They oh. just won some equestrian championships in like the 80s. <laughs> so it's a running joke. Thanks for that, Trey. Madcraft says, "Hope Big Bad Brad doesn't call him." Uh, I don't think there's a chance of that. <laughs> I don't. I don't even know if Cam Scott Come knows on, who Brad Clemson, is. Right? Open the coffers. Wouldn't that be a uh, unexpected plot twist? <laughs> I'm staying in state. I'm going to Clemson. <laughs> <laughs> Would not be good. Uh, Texas just landed an Arkansas transfer. Says one texter on the text line seven one three zero seven. Coming up next. Some really good news for Clemson. Baseball coming down the pipeline in terms of injury. Also, some really bad news for Clemson baseball. We'll look at what South Carolina and Clemson did over the weekend. Who is now trending up and who is now trending down? He's Diesel. I'm Cole Bryson, and this is the Fan Up State.
A lot of movement over the weekend in the Division I college baseball poll. Arkansas, who was the number one team in the country, dropped two of three over the weekend. The Razorbacks fall to number two in the country. And the team that was number two in the country, the Clemson Tigers, they dropped two of three to NC State over the weekend. They have fallen to sixth in the country. Virginia, they yeah, they quite a drop. I, I, Diesel, I'll be honest, I didn't know as bad as those losses were and then losing the upstate last week. I didn't know if it would be closer to eight or nine. But top ten now, uh, Virginia 10, East Carolina 9, Florida State 8, Duke 7, Clemson 6, Oregon State 5, Tennessee comes in at 4, Kentucky at 3, Arkansas at 2, A&M at 1, uh, pretty much ACC and SEC there. I mean, Let's see. The only teams that aren't the ACC and SEC are East Carolina and Oregon State <laughs> in the top ten. Yeah. So the uh, it's top ten. How much that power has shifted in baseball? To the sure. Teams. You used to see a lot of like UC Irvine, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those California schools used to be really good at baseball. A lot of movement, which is good, which is really really good. Um, one texter t- chimes in and says, please don't say South Carolina's trending up and try to make it your take. It won't end well. Well, texter, I'll say this. South Carolina, let, let's, let's, let's take opinions out of this. And we're going to get to what Carolina and Clemson both did over the weekend. Let's take opinions out of the equation and look solely at facts. Texter who says, please don't say South Carolina is trending up. I can't tell if this is a South Carolina I fan can't who either. want you to jinx it. I can't either. Or if this is a Clemson fan who's like, you can't give South Carolina any credit. So here's what I'll say. No opinions in the next 30 seconds, from me at least. South Carolina beat North Carolina. South Carolina then goes to Gainesville with revenge on their mind and takes two of three. Clemson drops to USC Upstate midweek last week and then goes – well, not goes, host NC State and drops two of three. So Clemson loses three of their last four. South Carolina wins three of four. And you don't want me to say that South Carolina is trending up? What, am I supposed to lie? Am I supposed to lie on this uh, very program, Diesel? Listen, NC State, that is not a great loss for Clemson. We'll start with Clemson. They did lose... To NC State, I was there for Saturday night's game, and NC State, a decent team, Diesel, but uh, Clemson was definitely the better team just last week was not their week. And you know how in baseball you go through slumps. It happens. It happens. They lost to USC Upstate uh, USC Upstate on Tuesday or Wednesday of last week and then lost two of three. Good news for Clemson is Eric Backett says Tristan Smith uh, from Bowling Springs right here in the Upstate is back in the rotation for this weekend, which is a huge lift to the pitching rotation. That's one of, with Tristan Smith in the rotation, one of the better staffs in the country. really is. So that's good news for Clemson. However, bad news for Clemson is your shortstop, Jufa, who is one of the better shortstops in the country, he got hurt last weekend on that turf field at Notre Dame, Diesel. They suspect that Chufa will be out for a while. When asked uh, about it Saturday night, Coach Eric Bakich was not very positive. He looked to the media, uh, the, the few media contingency, that the few of us that were there, and he said, Chufa's going to be out for a while. I have heard reports that it could be, you know, what you fear in, in a knee, you know, you, you have non-contact injuries in football, and one of Clemson's better, better players, the shortstop, is now going to be out for a while. It could be the season. We don't know, but uh, it is a leg injury that doesn't look good. So it's a huge blow to Clemson baseball because you're one of your best players, the player that single-handedly beat South Carolina in game two with a walk-off, is now out for a very long time. Good news, you're getting Tristan Smith back, but um, now that you're into the heart, the meat of ACC play, you're going to have to figure out how to fix that infield because Saturday night, four or five errors, how many ever the the Tigers had, I believe it was four, was uh, not good 
only one earned run Saturday night from NC State. So Clemson has a few holes that they have to figure out now in the infield. If they can figure them out, I think they'll be okay. Losing Chufa is bad. It really is bad for Clemson. However, on the flip side, Diesel, South Carolina going to Gainesville and taking two of three from Florida after beating North Carolina last week during a midweek game. Yeah. To the Texas point, how can we not say South Carolina is trending up? Yeah. Um, NC State, you know, 20 and 13 on the season before we get back over to South Carolina. 20 and 13 on the season. That includes this past weekend's results. Mm-hmm. They had been on a five game losing streak before facing Clemson. They had lost uh, 12 to four to East Carolina. Mm-hmm. They, they were run ruled in seven at Louisville, six to seven loss at Louisville, six to seven loss at Louisville, four to five loss to UNC Wilmington. And then, man, they got right. 11 8, 4 0, and then the third game loss, 7 to 0, Clemson's favor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clemson, you don't like being a get right team. No. To an NC State. And I, we don't know, you know, we haven't gone super deep in what's going on at NC State. There might have been a reason why they had lost five in a row, injuries possible. Um, but you don't want to be a get right team for a team like NC State. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking that this is going to be, you know, one of your, one of your blessed seasons, to get you back to where you want to be, hosting a regional and getting to Omaha. You can't let that happen. You can't. And I think that after Clemson last week had lost to Upstate, and then they dropped the first two to NC State, Eric back at Saturday night, he was trying his best to be positive. However, when you lose three in a row and you know how capable of a team you are, it is a little bit of a gut punch, right? It does sting a little bit. Um, and then flipping back to South Carolina Diesel, the SEC is brutal. Uh, they they have a tough schedule. They are now 25 and 11, 8 and 7 in conference. They've struggled out of the gate. They did take uh they did beat Vandy, swept Vandy, took three of three from them, lost to Bama, uh, Bama and AM, took two of three from South Carolina. Yeah. Now you play the number two team in the country this weekend at Founders Park in your own backyard in Arkansas. So well you also get uh, you know another midweek game uh, on the road South Carolina's on the road at Citadel. Should be a win. In the midweek that very well should be a win. They're having and, a rough season. Maybe, you know maybe you're you you get this as you, as a get back on track, light the bats up. Uh Citadel 16 and 18 on the on the season. Yeah. Um 0 and 9 in the Southern Conference. Citadel Ooh. is having a tough run of it right now. They are. So this is a game that you should win easily, and um, you know you should you should walk out of Charleston feeling pretty good about yourself. You know, I think the ceiling. Realistically, this is my opinion. I think the ceiling for South Carolina baseball this year is playing really well and having a chance to make it to a regional championship. Not at your park, though. I don't see South Carolina no. hosting a regional. However, I do think their ceiling is all of a sudden, if they do get hot in their regional, I think their ceiling, because they do have talent, they do have guys on this team that are really good. I like what I've seen the last few days, the last few weeks from Ethan Petrie. Um, I think that they're going to be okay. I just think that their ceiling is probably making it to a regional and maybe making a run toward the championship at the end. Yeah, it seems as if uh, Dalton Reeves is getting hot right now. He homered Saturday and Sunday in the Florida series. So that's big. Uh, if he can keep it up, he's hitting 360 on the season, four home runs, 12 RBIs. Uh, if he can keep that up and the Gamecocks lineup starts getting hot, I mean, look out. Like hey, I, said, I don't think they're going to be good enough to host a regional because just just because the SEC is so tough, uh, it's going to be really hard to to keep that going uh, through SEC play. However, uh, Diesel, good enough to make one. They did go from not being ranked last week to this week now being twentieth. So they go from yeah. not ranked there's to twentieth. Vol- there's some volatility. Maybe there's a little bit of helmet scouting going on in there. It's, it's tough to say. It will be interesting though. I, I want South Carolina and Clemson both to continue to improve. I, I'm most interested to see if Clemson is in a legit slump or 
that they just have a few bad games. Because if they just had a few bad games and they get back on track tomorrow against Charlotte and then again this weekend and the next weekend they have Louisville, I think they could be fine. But if this continues, then I'll raise a flag, raise a level of concern for Clemson. But on the South Carolina side, I am very inter- interested to see Diesel if they can continue this and build on it because Arkansas is going to be a different animal. Luckily, you do get them at home, however. Yeah, um, South Carolina seems to be, you know, as you said, trending up at the moment, um, doing really well with some plate discipline. They're leading the country in walks right wow. now. Uh, and they snapped Florida's 15 series home winning yeah. streak, which dates back to April of 2022. So uh, that's guys, big, man. You guys know who you can tweet that at. And and tell them let them, tell them your friends down here in South Carolina said what's up. <laughs> when we come back, Cole, you ever heard that saying that women aren't funny? Like women, female comedians just aren't funny. Sure, we're gonna test that with a non-comedian, but a female athlete. Everybody knows. We're gonna get to that next here on <coughs> Wire to Wire. He's Cole Bryce and I'm Diesel. If you're listening on your phone. Awesome. If you're listening over the air, 97.7 FM in Greenville, 97.1 FM in Spartanburg, we thank you. If you're listening after the fact, appreciate it. Do us a favor. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Help us grow this thing. This is the Fan Up State.
J.D. in Simpsonville asking for your continued prayers. Says, I'm going to go listen to my mother-in-law's BS. I I hope, J.D., for your sake, that you're not listening to us with your mother-in-law in in the house. Sounds like a... uh... You're Tolo, and I know you are. (laughs) So I'm sure every radio in the house is playing wire to wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson. I (laughs) hope... But your mother-in-law is not an earshot of any of those radios. Yeah, I hope so. That's probably not a good thing. Uh, Stephen Webb just rode by the new Spartanburg Baseball Stadium. Lots of dirt moving around. Yeah, Stephen, I've been seeing a lot of posts, uh, a lot of articles coming out over the past couple of days and weeks about the uh, Spartanburg Baseball Stadium. It looks nice. Oh, the drawings, man, are breathtaking. It's going to be about half the size of the Greenville Drive Stadium, Mm -hmm. about 3,500 seats for the Spartanburg team to about 6,500 seats. We had a texter last week ask us if we ever thought that the Clemson South Carolina series would ever be played at the Spartanburg stadium. Sure. I doubt it based on just the number of tickets that can be sold unless we won't know until it opens, right? We won't know if the configuration would allow them to install temporary seating for that series, I don't think Spartanburg's enough of a draw. No, for for Clemson no, to Carolina, I, I think not it, yet. And and just on top of that, you know, uh, Floor Field has the contracts in place. They are um, they are well entrenched with that series. So I don't know that that unless something crazy happens yeah, I don't see in the Upstate. It. And if that happened, the Upstate may lose that series entirely. But no, I have drove by it recently. It does look like they're uh, getting ready to start. I don't want to say construction, but like there's nothing up yet. There is a lot of dirt moving to Stevens Point, but I'll tell you this, Diesel, it's April. Yeah. They better get to moving. They, they say 2025. That's next open. year. Yeah, it's a year away. I'm talking about that's a lot of construction to get done in a year. That is um you got to think about it. If the season opens early April, You've got to have that joker ready by February, March. Then again, if they're trying to put up a dentist office or a water burger, they'd have that thing up in like 6 weeks. True. Because <laughs> everywhere you look, it's it's dentist office, water burgers, fast food fast food restaurants. Man, they put those suckers up quick. But that thing, there's no way. Surely you can't throw a stadium up there. I mean, I guess you can, man. I guess I I guess I underestimate it. That to me just seems quick. I should have 3D printed it. It's gonna be the most Spartanburg thing ever for them to not have it up in time. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I can say that because I'm from Spartanburg. <laughs> it's going to be the most Spartanburg thing in the world when they come around in January and say, well, yeah, we're going to have to push it off. <laughs> yeah, they don't have any running water so they could put ice in the, in the bathrooms. We don't have a team name yet either. What's, yeah, we still, don't, we still don't know it. No, we still don't. I love the Hub City Hoot name. I don't know why Wood Ducks was a problem. Left, they, Wood Ducks was the prior team name in North Carolina or wherever it was. Yeah. What's wrong with that? It could have saved some money. I, I remember going to the first – First game of the Greenville uh, <laughs> Arena football team, and they still had the Austin Rattlers field. The Austin, I think it was the Rattlers. I could be wrong there, but it was the Austin team. They yeah. they had literally like they had just bought it the night before, and they shipped it, and it didn't wasn't big enough to cover the entire floor at the Bon Secours Wellness Arena. Mm-hmm. And like if a guy caught a touchdown, and he was still full speed running through the back of the end zone, heated up on concrete. So they had to go buy cheap, uh, cheap AstroTurf from Home Depot so that there was nice. something covering nice. the concrete. Because I'm sure you can imagine a grown man running at full speed gets cleats on concrete. Ugh. He's going down fast and hard. So, Matt, I'm sorry. Trey yeah. says uh, the team name will be the Spartanburg Dollar Generals. That's great. <laughs> that is great. Uh, that is true, though. Texter says if they if a fair can throw a roller coaster up in a few hours, surely they can throw a stadium together in a year. You would think so. Yeah, that's why I don't. That's why I don't ride fair roller coasters. No thanks. Did you ever see that? There was a video uh, like a year ago of it looked like you know one of the miniature like pirate ship, you know oh, rides, I, uh-uh. and it started like lifting off the ground. No thanks. And there were like dozens of concerned citizens running up to this thing and grabbing hold of hell. No, am I not no, grabbing good. hold of that thing? I'm good. No, I am not going to be a part of your final destination scenario. As a matter of fact, this weekend I was driving down the road and there was a log truck in front of me mm-hmm. 
And I, I pulled over and I said, no, I'm going to let that guy get on ahead. You didn't want to. I, I didn't want to get final destination. Another movie that you've never seen, but it's, it's, it affects <laughs> my entire generation. Okay. I'm 39, going to be 40 here in a couple of months. Like if I see a logging truck, I pull over and say, hell no. I ain't sitting behind <laughs> this great. logging truck, not sitting behind it. I guess if you missed it over the weekend, your girl, Caitlin Clark was on Saturday night live. Caitlin Clark can ball. We all know this setting records left and right last season, but is Caitlin Clark funny? We got a couple of clips from her time on Saturday night live. We're going to break this apart. We're going to, you know, parse it out piece by piece. and We'll find out if she's funny. Now the, she was on weekend update with Colin Jost, Michael Che. Those two are funny. We already know that we need to find out if Caitlin Clark is funny. So here's clip number one of Caitlin's appearance on SNL. The University of Iowa announced that basketball star Caitlin Clark will have her jersey retired and replaced with an apron. <laughs> God. <laughs> Jeez. Well, the NBA, WNBA draft, the WNBA draft is this Monday, and Iowa star Caitlin Clark is expected to be the number one pick. Here to comment is Caitlin Clark. <laughs> so he rips her. But nothing for my joke, whatever. <laughs> I am a fan, Caitlin, by the way. Really, Michael? Because I heard that little apron joke you did. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a joke. We're just having fun, you know? You make a lot of jokes about women's sports. Don't you, Michael? I wouldn't say a lot, but, you know, it's not on the regular. Yeah, no, it's definitely a lot. Uh, I actually sort of made a super cut. Take a look. Well, no, we don't have to do that. <laughs> a number of sports bars around the country are promising to only show women's basketball games during March Madness. The bars are known collectively as the empty ones. God. A new report claims that recent stories on, on the Sports Illustrated website were actually generated by AI. And it's already making glaring mistakes. For instance, it made up something called the WNBA. Like, Jeez. Iowa's final four game against UConn was the most watched women's college basketball game ever with 14.2 million viewers, beating the previous record by 14.2 million viewers. Wow. Call with the receipts. Thanks, man. No problem. You know, unlike Che, I support women. Whoa. So that's, that, that's what she had to walk into. She walked into a hostile environment, much as she did many times throughout the season. Caitlin Clark, though, an unflappable competitor. She came back uh, hard and fast against Michael Che, uh, a guy that had been ripping her gender and, and the sports that she loves and she's been a part of and given so much to. Uh, she came back. She came back, I think, fairly well. No, hold on. I think you're a great basketball player. I mean, I can't play like you do. Yeah, we know. And obviously, I can't tell jokes like you do. Thank you for that. But I did write some jokes, and it would mean a lot to me if you read some of them. Just right over there on the cards. Well. <laughs> the Indiana Fever have the first pick in this Monday's draft. A reminder that Indiana Fever is a WNBA team and not what Michael Che gave to dozens of women at Purdue University. <laughs> sure <are> the jokes, <laughs> You really wrote these yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Netflix's top new show is Ripley, featuring an eerie, unsettling performance by actor Andrew Scott. Critics say it's the hardest thing to watch on Netflix since Michael Che's special shame is up. <laughs> This year, Caitlin Clark broke the record for three-pointers in a single season, and I have three-pointers for Michael Che. One B, two funnier, three dumbass. <laughs> Jeez, man. Assuming she wrote that. It's a solid you think she did? Michael? Yeah, no problem, and, and good luck in the WNBA. I hope you have a great first season. So there you go. He, he was nice at the end, uh, but she she wrote those jokes. You think she really wrote them? I, uh, I hope she did, but I don't, th I don't know. There's I, no I, way. I don't know that she did because her, her delivery was very dry. I'm not sure that she has a whole lot of comedic timing, though. She did prove it here at the very end that she has some comedic timing. Listen to this. Good luck in the WNBA. I hope you have a great first season. Thanks. I'm sure it will be a big first step for me. 
but it's just one step for the WNBA. Thanks to all the great players like Cheryl Swoops, Lisa Leslie, Cynthia Cooper, the great Don Staley, and my basketball hero, Maya Moore. These are the women that kicked down the door so I could walk inside. So I want to thank them tonight for laying the foundation. And Michael, since you're such a big fan, I brought you a souvenir. It's an apron signed by me. <laughs> God. Good for her. Good for her. Thank you. I, I can't wait to give this to my girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> nice That's shot, great. Mike. Nice shot. That's great. All Welcome. right. It is time for the five o'clock fight coming up next. What are we going to debate today? You better be ready. It's your chance to weigh in and let us know who wins. He's Diesel. I'm Cole Bryson. Five o'clock fight next on the Fan Up State.
Coming up in the very next segment, we'll bring on former Gamecock, current head coach at North Greenville University, Landon Powell, will join us right here on the Fan Upstate. Be here at 520 for that. But before we get there, before we get to the nice cities and have a good time with Landon, talk about how good his baseball team is again, <laughs> Cole and I have got to put our Dukes up. It's time for the five o'clock fight. Every day at five o'clock, we pick three topics, sometimes sports, sometimes not. We have to disagree. We have to fight it out. And you decide who wins the fight. You are the judge. You are the jury. You are the executioners. You decide who's winning this thing. So let's hit it. Here we go, Diesel. You ready? Yeah, and if you think of something really good that Cole and I need to fight about it, we'll tell you at the end of the segment how you can submit your five o'clock fights. But the rules are simple. Three topics. We have to disagree. You decide who wins the fight. So text in 71307 throughout. Tell us who's winning each round of the fight. We got three of them. There can be no ties. Here we go with round number one. If you were playing in a major golf tournament, Cole. Which will never happen. Which will never happen. <laughs> but let's just say hypothetically that you were. Would you rather, down the stretch, final round of the tournament, would you rather tee off early and have no pressure? I mean, there's pressure on you to play well, right? But you don't, there's no pressure on you to hit certain marks on the day. Or would you rather tee off late? So would you rather lead or would you rather chase knowing what you have to do that is that is tough that is really really tough i like the question though i would say like scotty scheffler finished early he yeah he was playing without the pressure of knowing the players in front of him i would probably Diesel say that I would not want to play early. I would probably want to be in the latter. So what I mean is I would rather know what I have to do. Yeah. Kind of like uh, you and I talked about yesterday when you defer in NFL overtime, right? You know what you have to do after your defense gets off the field. So I'm going to go. That's a tough one, but I'm going to go with the latter and play late with the added pressure. I would want to tee off first. I would want to go out there and play loose, play free, and just go out there and play the best possible round that I can play. If somebody chases me and beats me, that's that it is what it is, right? But I know that all I have to do is go out and play my best possible round, and I don't have to worry about it. Like, I don't have to say, ooh, I have to eagle this par five to get into this, right? I don't mm -hmm. have to really push. I can just go out there and play great golf. So I would rather play – Early without the pressure, play loose, play free. You want to know exactly what it is you have to do. You want to chase. You want to pursue. So there you go. That's round one. Who wins? You tell us on the text line, 71307. Start your text with keyword fan. Here we go with our second fight. Now, the idea for this fight came in from Adam from Spartanburg. He texted in a very simple question. Mike Tyson or Jake Paul? <laughs> who's who's going to win this fight? I, I think, unfortunately, Adam, Cole and I both agree that Mike Tyson is going to win this fight. Like, I don't know that it's even going to be anywhere close. But I want to extend your question here, Adam. I think I want to take it to somewhere a little more interesting, okay? A better question might be, are you in or are you out on all of these spectacle exhibition matches that we're getting across sports right now? Do you love them or do you hate them? Cole. I actually do not like him. I don't think that it's real boxing or real fighting. I think it's what you said, a spectacle. So, Diesel, I would say no. I know that it drives ratings and it pays a big bag. And Jake Paul and Mike Tyson, two of the biggest names in the world, right? Everybody knows who Jake Paul is. Everyone knows who Mike Tyson is. But 
I just feel as if back in the day, this would have been laughed at. Well, yeah. It would have been. I'm not for it. But it would have been laughed at back in the day because they had legitimate stars in boxing. But we don't have legitimate stars in boxing anymore, which is why I say, yes, give me these spectacles. Give me these exhibitions. Look, we all know, anybody who's watching it, anybody who's paying for this knows that it's a farce. It's yeah. not real, right? Like, I mean, it is real, and they are out there throwing punches at each other. But – like it's not a it's not like they're actually fighting for a belt or anything. Uh I'd be willing to bet that very very few of our listeners you you especially Cole could name a current belt holder in any weight classification in boxing. No way. You can't do it because no there's no stars. Like you don't know who any of these guys are. Most of them we can't even pronounce their names. So that's why I say yes to the only things that get ratings anymore which is exhibitions, which is making things a little weird, making things a little crazy. We're trying to create these viral moments with these weird matchups. I say yes to it because it's the only thing that people pay attention to anymore. So there you, there you go. That's round two. Who won? 71307. Text in. We got one more fight to go. <laughs> I'm laughing at text. <laughs> Honey mustard. Or barbecue sauce. Oh, boy. Honey mustard or barbecue sauce. First of all, what are we putting this on? Are we put it on like chicken wings? What are we putting on? What are we putting it on? Anything? Just just jump Well, purpose? that's a great question. So last night, I put it on chicken. I think chicken's probably the – let's go with chicken for this, uh, for this fight, for this example. I got some chicken tendies last night. Me too. Yeah. And you got you got honey mustard. I'm yeah, honey mustard all day long. Team honey mustard. I think honey mustard is one of those condiments that you don't put on many different things. Like you don't eat honey mustard on a lot of foods, but I think chicken tenders are made for honey mustard for whatever reason. Honey mustard and chicken tenders go hand in hand. I mean, it's it's you know it's it's just perfect. There's nothing better. I like honey mustard, but it's not versatile enough for me. That's why I'm saying barbecue sauce. It's more versatile. You can get the spicy. You can get the sweet. You can get the tangy. I don't go for <coughs> like the super sweet barbecue sauces. I don't love. I don't love them. I want something with a little heat. I want something that's gonna not not challenge me. I don't want it to be so nasty that I don't want to eat it. Uh -huh. But I do want something that's got a little heat. So I think barbecue sauce is more versatile than honey mustard. You can put it on more things. Barbecue sauce, depending on what it is, can work really, really well on brisket. It can work on chicken wings, chicken tendies. Oh, all it, of it. it so, definitely so works on more. Barbecue sauce is better to me. Yeah, I agree that it definitely works on more things. But if I have to choose, like for chicken tenders, I'll go honey mustard. So I'm a honey mustard guy. I like honey mustard. I think it's uh, obviously it's not good for you, but it is uh, it is delicious. Uh, real quick note. I have put all three fights on Twitter at the Fan Up State. So you can text in, you can chime in on the stream, phone lines open as well, or you can vote on our Twitter at the Fan Up State. Diesel, all three fights are there, all three rounds. Let us know who you're siding with. Yep, those but are our three fights. They were round one. If you're in a major tournament, would you rather tee off early or late? I said early, Cole said late. Uh, round two, are you in or are you out on the spectacle exhibition matches that we're getting, especially in fighting? Cole said he's out. I said I'm in. I like him because, well, it's the only thing that really gets people paying attention to it anymore. Speaking of which, <laughs> uh, we had Madcraft who said Tyson Fury. Uh, no, Tyson Fury does not hold uh, a, a belt right now in boxing. Uh, Usyk, Billiam Smith, uh, Better Vayev, Alvarez, Gosh, Alim, Alim Kunli, don't know. Uh, Fundora, Crawford, Lopez, Navarrete, Espinoza, and Maloney are your current belt holders in boxing. That goes from a heavyweight all the way down to welterweight or bantamweight. Names that I have never heard of. So none of, no, these, guys, I had none of these guys are stars. So why would I give a rip if these guys are out there fighting? And then final round, I said, uh, was, uh, which is better, honey mustard or barbecue sauce? Cole loves that honey mustard. Mm. I love that barbecue barbecue sauce. You tell us who won.
a lot of texts coming in, Diesel. Um, the five o'clock, the five o'clock fight every day. It never fails never. to get the interaction, man. Love it. I mean, we have so many texts that I really uh, am struggling to figure out where to start. One texter says, come on now, drop the hammer and destroy everyone else. Round one, Cole. John Dog says, who is Jake Paul? <laughs> That's what I was <laughs> laughing at. Uh, Diesel round one, but only because Cole knows nothing about golf. Diesel round two, also winner. Cole, you got to get toed up, man. Maybe you should choose the questions. Uh, another texter says, the best for, oh, bleep word, the best for last. Trip says, chicken nuggets, french fries, and honey mustard all day, every day. And uh, another texter, mix barbecue sauce and honey mustard with some mayo, and you've got Chick-fil-A sauce. Is that true? Qu texter, where are you getting this info? This, this, seems Wait like a minute. A, this seems like a trade secret. This seems like a deep, deeply held Chick-fil-A trade secret. Is I mean, that right? I had Chick-fil-A sauces. I think you just add a little mayonnaise and then you got a sauce, right? <laughs> I, uh, I had Chick-fil-A sauce today. So, again, texter says, mix barbecue and honey mustard. With mayo, and you've got, I don't know if I buy that. Is that right? We've got to do some research, man. Maybe we should make it ourselves. Right well, I was going to say, alive. if I can figure out how to make my own uh, Chick fil A, I love Chick fil A sauce. It's the best. So, Texter, we're going to try that. Another Texter says, Diesel wins round one, Cole wins round two, Cole wins round three. That oh. comes from Gordon. Um, another text says, Only pro wrestling fans like barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mongo, can I get my mat fee, please? He also chimes in the texter says about the uh, Chick Fil A sauce. He says it's true. There you go. There you go. You want to get your uh, your thoughts in, your fights in? Send me an email, Diesel at thefanupstate dot com. Just put the word "fight" as the subject line of your message. Uh, sometimes we'll, uh, we'll 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 add to it a little bit. So Mike Tyson, Jake Paul. Do you think there's any way that Jake Paul lands a couple of punches? Yeah, I Mike think Tyson's going to tear his head off. No, I think he does. I think he does. I think he does land a few. Like. As much as I dislike him, he's he's not terrible. I think there's going to be rules in place that stop Mike Tyson from ending Jake Paul's life. Mike's not. I don't like. Have I'm you not, not seen him warming up. No, I uh, get his, it. His I, uh, his uh, training. It is insane how fast he is. Still. I get it. I just wonder. Like, I'll watch. We talked about this yesterday. I'll watch because I want to see if it's if he's still ha if he still got it. I just don't know. He's gotten old, man. He he really has. By, by the yeah. way, Diesel, online Google confirms Chick-fil-A sauce as mayo, barbecue sauce, and honey mustard. I, I made the mistake of I went out to a friend's house to watch uh, one of the Conor McGregor uh, fake fights. Yeah. And I said, never again. I said, never again will I support this in any way, shape, or form. I'm not buying it on pay-per-view. I'm not, uh, not going to go to anybody's house or go to a bar and give them money for, for showing these idiotic fights i don't like them but it's the only thing that gets people to pay attention anymore so sure. i understand why you feel like you have to do it again in an, in an incredible we, we keep talking about sports that are floundering a little bit golf is one of them nascar is another one mm -hmm. and we look at it and say why can't they create stars out of these sports remember when boxing heavyweight stars were like were worldwide stars mm -hmm. they're not that anymore no Golfers, the tippy tops are not worldwide stars anymore. NASCAR drivers are not worldwide stars in the way that Jeff Gordon and <laughs> Dale, Dale Earnhardt were worldwide stars. Why do you think that is? Well, I think UFC's taken over boxing. You think? I think so. As much as I, I mean, like this there past are weekend, fighters who would be boxing, who yeah. are who are going into and devoting their lives to UFC instead. Sure, but I, I'll be honest with you, I can't name any major boxers right now. It's just, I don't know that it's as bad off as golf or NASCAR in terms yeah. of floundering, but it's got to be close. Yeah, I mean, I, I went down this list of the guys who are currently holding the belts uh, at their various weight classes in boxing, and I think I've heard of Better Vaev. I think I've heard of him. Hmm. But outside of that, uh, I think Canelo, Al I've, I've heard of Canelo Alvarez. That guy has been around for quite a while. I have to. Uh, he's, he is a legitimate star in boxing, but I think he's a star inside of boxing. Like we were saying with Scotty Scheffler, yeah. he's a star inside the world of boxing. He is not transcending boxing in any way, shape, or form. So I think that's the problem with a lot of these sports. They are just not creating stars anymore. And it, I think a lot of it has to do with just our attention is so splintered 
that uh, you know it would it would take way too much in marketing to even come close to creating a star like that anymore. I think so too. Um, but I'll tell you this: if I had to get into one, I'm not big into UFC either. But if I had to get into one, I would probably be able to get into UFC before I got into boxing. I'll be honest with you. But I will watch. I will watch Paul and Tyson. When is it? Uh, let me look it up real. I'm quick. sorry, I didn't, put, put, didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm thinking summertime, right? Uh, July twentieth. July Saturday 20th. night, July twentieth, and it's on Netflix. I mean, if if Jake Paul wins this thing, I mean, like I know he gets to say I beat Mike Tyson, but I'm like, dude, you're beating a sixty plus year old. That's what I'm saying. He's old. He's old. He's old. Damn, is he scary when you watch his training videos? All right, coming up next, as Diesel hinted at earlier in the program, Landon Powell, former South Carolina Gamecock, currently the head baseball coach at North Greenville. All he seems to do uh, here in Greenville County in Division II baseball is win. We'll talk to Coach Powell of North Greenville next.
Coming back now to talk a little college baseball. We've talked baseball already in the program, but we're going to take it a little bit more local now. A little bit, uh, I say a little bit, a lot local. So we're going to be joined by Landon Powell, head baseball coach at North Greenville University, right here in Greenville County. Coach, we so much uh, appreciate having you on the program each and every time. And I want to start off with uh, this past weekend. It was senior day for you and your team. Last home game before you have nine uh, more contests to close out Division II. This Division II season, obviously, you guys do wrap up a little earlier than Division I. But how was this senior day with the seniors that you have? How was this one different from the other ones you've experienced, Coach? Well, Cole, I appreciate it. I always enjoy joining, joining you on the show. So uh, thanks for having me and uh, for covering my program and then college baseball. We appreciate that. Uh, senior day was, it's always a really fun day. It's also an emotional day. Um, you know, you, you grow to love these kids and, and build relationships with them and they become family. So when it's time for them to move on and join the world, it's, uh, you, you know, you're proud of them. You're excited, but you also, you know, you wish you could, start over and do it again with them and, and not, not have them leave and, and go on. You just love spending so much time around them. So um, it's, it's a sad day for that reason, but um, we've got a great group of players here and especially our seniors are guys that have been here and had great careers and accomplished amazing things. Um, you know, several of our seniors have won three or four conference championships and a national championship and have set school records. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a really fun time to kind of, reminisce and celebrate all the things they've accomplished but also it's a sad time because you realize that their great careers are coming to an end and you're going to miss having them and their production and their success and um you know you wish you could just keep them forever but um it was a great day we won both games um one of our seniors pat monte who's an all-american and had an incredible career here he had a he had three home runs and two or three doubles and had an, an impressive day reese fields who's also had an incredible career here and been an All-American and a College World Series MVP. He uh, he won another game and, and threw a complete game in doing so. And the, um, he's the all-time active wins leader in NCAA baseball right now, any level, D1, D2, D3. He's the all-time wow. um, win, uh, like active wins leader in, in uh, any college baseball right now. So yeah. um, those are some highlights from senior day, but it was a lot of fun. Landon Powell, uh, head coach for the North Greenville Crusaders, joins us here on Wire to Wire with Cole Bryson and Diesel. Landon, how is it easier to pull uh, teachable moments from uh, from a win or from a loss when you've got a team that's thirty two and nine? You're dominant, and you've been dominant year in and year out. You know where are you pulling these teachable moments from uh, when you've had just this, so much success over the past couple of seasons? Well, I mean, you try to you try to always find teachable moments, whether it's practice or um, team meetings or weight room or, or games. I mean, you, as a coach, you're looking for every opportunity um, to try to and you know help these guys develop any way possible. I would say the 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 best answer to that would probably be losses. I mean, I think losing um, makes you more open to coaching and adjustments and changes. Um, so. I've been fortunate in my life to be a part of a lot of winning teams, a lot of success. And, you know, I, I can tell you that I don't remember a lot of the wins and victories as much as I remember the losses. Um, it, it's hard for me to sit here and really, if I think about high school state championships or college world series games at South Carolina or a perfect game in the big leagues or national championship in college baseball coaching, I couldn't tell you much about those games. Like I don't remember a lot of details. I don't remember a lot of stories from those games. But if you go back and talk about some of the big losses in my life, um, like losing a high school state championship as a sophomore or you know, losing a national championship game against Texas in college, I can almost tell you every pitch of those games. So I think that's interesting that, you know, the, for me in my career, losses have had a bigger impact. And uh, I don't like losing. I really like winning. And so when you lose, you try to figure out ways not to, to, not to experience that again. And um, that's probably how I coach. My players have done a tremendous job this year. 32 and nine is nothing to be upset about, but you know, nine losses at this point last year, we were 32 and two, you know, so um, we've, we've definitely lost this year more than last year, but we're still doing great. I think we're number three or four in the country and we're first in the region. So um, we can't complain too much. We're doing well, but got to finish strong down the stretch, Cole. We got a lot of good baseball left to play and need to need to finish out strong. Coach, when you talk about a guy like Pat Monteith, uh, this is probably a two-part question. I guess part one would be, when you recruited Pat, 
did you expect him to have the career that he's had? And then the second part of this question would be, what does a guy like Pat and the success he's had do for you and the program when it comes to bringing in other recruits like Pat? Well, I mean, so part one, um, I can't say that I expected Pat to have the success he's had. I mean, he's he's going to be one of the top three or four greatest players to ever play here when he's done at the end of his career. So uh, I, I would have never expected that. He was a great player in high school and had a lot of talent, um, wasn't heavily recruited and um, was a, a later recruit for us. Um, but, but we knew the talent was there. He just was a little maybe raw and a little rough around the edges. But he came in as a freshman and figured it out pretty quickly. He was conference freshman of the year and uh, has never slowed down and had a tremendous career, um, was an All-American last year and a preseason All-American this year. And, you know, last year, for the folks listening, he, he hit 390 with 19 home runs. He led the country in walks and runs scored, um, led all of Division II baseball in those two stats. So he's also a tremendous defensive player. He steals 20 bases every year. He's a great athlete. So tremendous, tremendous player. But um, it – what he's done for our program um, can't be understated. Not only the success that he's had on the field, it's helped us win games. And, you know, he was the third baseman on the national championship winning team in 22. And then last year was the center fielder on the team that went back to the world series. So he's been a huge, like key in the you know cog in the wheel for us. But on top of that, the things that can't be understated is what he brings to the field every day. Pat, Pat Monteith has the, the best work ethic of any player I've ever coached. He's a top 1% kid when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, he's an incredible teammate, very loved and uh, revered by his teammates. Um, he never takes a day off his entire four-year career. He's only um, only missed one practice, and it was when I made him miss because we flew to San Diego for an award he was given, and I went with him. But that's the only day he missed a practice in four years. He's a tremendous kid, tremendous player, um, very um, very unique person, and uh, I love I love him in many different ways. But uh, I'm going to miss him. But he has left a lasting imprint on our program. The, the freshmen, the younger guys that are here, they've seen how he approaches the game. They've seen how he's practiced. Um, they see that he never takes a day off, and you know they they strive to be like him because he's been our best player. And you know um, when a guy like that's not only your best player on the field, but he's also the hardest worker and the best character. Uh, that that just makes your program that much better. So. Um, he's as a coach, I've been fortunate, Cole, and you know, I mean, I've, I've coached some incredible players the last couple of years, but to have a John Michael fail and a Pat Monty and a Reese Fields and some of those guys, is like those are generational players that coaches usually only get once in a lifetime. And I was fortunate to have them all at the same time. Coach Landon Powell joins us here on the fan upstate coach. You know, we've had you on the fan upstate several times in the past and you've always talked about, you know, just how few players you have, transferring out of your program talk about how valuable it is to you as a coach to be able to keep the guys for an entire college run we hear it in major college football where coaches are are still trying to put a roster together at this point and they're just about to enter spring practice how, how much does it mean to you to be able to keep these guys uh, right there in tigerville for three four straight years you know when you recruit guys in high school the go your plan when you recruit them is that you know it's going to go just like the Pat Monteith experience or the John Michael Fay experience so you're going to you're going to get to have them for all four years and they're going to have great careers and reach all their potential and that's what you hope when you recruit guys but i mean in college baseball today that's just not reality i mean it's very rare that kids are staying in one place for four years and um but we've been fortunate here at North Greenville not to have many guys transfer i think i think uh you know we have a fun atmosphere and uh, i think i treat my players well and um, you know, I, I respect them. I give them a lot of freedom. I'm, I'm not a, I don't think I'm a mean, like a uh, drill sergeant type coach. I think it's more of a laid back atmosphere. So that, that's something players like. Also, we've been winning. We've had success. So, you know, players like to be a part of something, win a winning culture. They they want to, they want to strive and fight for something. So uh, I think that's helped us keep players. Uh, but to be honest, like I know that time will change. I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable that guys are going to leave our program because, we have a lot of talent. We have a lot of good players. And so there's there's good players that are sitting on the bench that aren't getting a lot of the bats or a lot of innings that if they were on other programs, they would play a lot. And uh, and I realize that and, and know that. So uh, there's going to come a time where some guys do transfer, and that's just part of the business. And um, But I, I hope to keep them all. I, I, I like to build the relationships with them, and I, I treat them like family. And so I, I, don't, I don't want them to leave. Landon Powell joining us on Wire to Wire right here on the Fan Upstate uh, head baseball coach at North Greenville. Coach, uh, two years ago, you took your team to a national championship. When you look at this year's team, 
Do you ever find yourself as a coach thinking about characteristics that you saw two years ago that maybe you see on this year's team that gives you hope for another run? Yeah, I mean, every team is different, and um, that's something as a coach. I mean, I've only been doing this about 10 years, but, you know, you, you do you do recognize that, that every team is different for different reasons. Some of them will have a lot of talent, um, but maybe they're – maybe the character is not quite right, or maybe the, the players don't click with each other and they don't have that tight bond. And maybe that team doesn't accomplish as much. And then there's other teams that maybe the talent isn't as elite, but they love each other and they're a brotherhood. And, and they just are so connected emotionally that they play above their skill level. And I've had a couple of those teams. Um, the last couple of years, we've been really, really talented. Um, we've, we've been as, uh, as talented as anybody we've played. And we've also been very connected um, as a brotherhood and as, you know, an emotional connection. So um, that has helped us have those two great seasons in a row and go to the World Series two years in a row, win 50 games two years in a row. That's all because of, you know, we've checked both boxes. Um, this year's team is definitely different. Uh, it's younger. We only are starting one senior right now, which is very unusual for us, and that's Monty. Um, and we got a lot of young guys. We're starting two freshmen pretty regularly, starting four sophomores. So it's a younger team. And they're still good, and they're doing great. And like I said, they're they're top five in the country and number one in the region. But um, the experience maybe isn't quite there, and um, I'm still kind of waiting to see that that you know some of the magic click or some of the confidence that you need to be a World Series champion type team. Um, I don't know if they're quite there yet, but that's what we're working on these last couple of weeks is trying to get them all meshed and feeling good, and you know loving competing with each other and. Um, not scared of any moment. Those are the kind of things we're trying to, to, to get them feeling before we get to the playoffs. Landon Powell, head baseball coach at North Greenville. Landon, you know, 10 seasons, record 350, 116, and one. You, uh, obviously, you've had, I'm sure, offers and opportunities to leave North Greenville, but you've stayed committed to North Greenville. How has your athletic director uh, in the past and this year rewarded you for your commitment to North Greenville. How have you seen things, you know, drastically change for the better just in your tenure there? Well, I mean, um, things have definitely improved since I've gotten here. We've, we've been fortunate um, to raise some money and then do new facilities. So anybody that's come and seen our field, you know, back in 2017, we put the uh, first all turf baseball field in the state of South Carolina at any college or high school or university. We're the first one to have a, a turf field in the entire state that was a big deal. And we raised a bunch of money to make that happen. The Dillard family out of Spartanburg, Ray and B Dillard and their family are responsible for, for this turf field. So that was a donation that I, that I worked hard at getting and that made a big difference. And then in 2020, um, we put a new press box and stadium seating and everything behind home plate. Also um, new netted backstop hey. and um, bullpen. What's the password for this computer? Just so a lot of, out. a lot of changes in, in 2020 it- as well. And, uh, and that was another significant donation made by the Bomar family, Dr. George Bomar. Um, and, and he's a local guy here in the Greenville area. Um, so you get some big donations like that. They make a huge difference in your program. And we have some other things on the horizon currently. This year, uh, we, we added TrackMan. So we have TrackMan at our field, which is a big addition. It helps with the development and coaching of our players. And, and uh, this summer, we plan to put a building over our batting cages and enclose that area and put a player's lounge down there. So we're really trying to make this a top-notch, best facility. We're, you know, we've already, you know, we, I think we're widely considered one of the best Division II baseball programs in the country. Now we want our facility to, to also match that. But uh, our school has been supportive. North Greenville has been a great place to work. They've been very supportive of our program. And um, I, I love working here. And I, I think uh, yeah, that's why I've turned down some of the jobs. I've been offered several jobs the last couple, couple summers and have decided to turn them down. And I just don't really want to leave Greenville. My wife and family loves living here. And, um, you know, she, my wife, Allison was born and raised here. So I know this is where she wants to be. And, um, I got a great situation in North Greenville, so there's no reason for me to leave. Coach, we so much appreciate your time. Best of luck in the remaining nine. And we will, uh, hopefully talk to you again real soon. All right. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for the support. Absolutely. That's coach Landon Powell, head baseball coach at North Greenville. Uh, it, it was kind of funny diesel in that interview, how, when we talked about this season, I think you brought it up the nine wins or excuse me, the nine losses, you know, that's, that's, that's low. That's a lot of losses yeah. for him. Uh, what a, what a job he's done to the, get to the point where you have nine losses and he's talking about, man, we've yeah. lost too many this I'm year. Not, I'm not surprised, you know, um, a competitor like that saying something like, sure. I 
can't remember a lot of the wins. Yeah. But I remember almost every single one of the losses. I love Mad Crass message here. He said, kid just hit a bomb <laughs> in the background. Yeah, you, you can tell when you hear great contact, you can hear it. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a shot. He there told me that. before the uh, interview that he was in the visitor's dugout. He said, can you hear me okay? And I said, <laughs> I got you loud and clear. So uh, look, look, man, I, I'll tell you this. For them being Division II, I don't think they get enough credit and coverage from local media outlets. Um, he's won a national championship there. And I'll tell you this, before he got there, North Greenville baseball wasn't really a thing. He yeah, turned it around. I, I fully believe that, um, you know, if NGU baseball played uh, 25 games against Clemson and 25 games against South Carolina, I fully believe that they could win close to half of those games. I well, mean, I, I think they would run pretty much 50-50 with a, with a team like that. They're just they're loaded, just man. a complete baseball team. They are, and and he's had so much talent. You t he talked about the players that have come through there, like the Reese Fields and the John Michael Fells and now the Pat Monty's. He's put players in the pros, and, and you know, it's so crazy because we, we talk about Landon Powell being, you know, maybe the next coach for this school or this program, but you heard him. I mean, he loves Greenville. There's no reason for him to leave. I've had offers. I've had opportunities. But NGU has been so good to him. He sees no real reason to leave. Hey, next week, Cole and I are going to be live at Dave & Buster's Woodruff Road in Greenville on Thursday from 3 to 7 for our draft special. You got burning questions about the draft. Now would be a good time to go ahead and start getting them to us. And we'll start working on some answers for you as well. Hey, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, a, a mentality among fans that may be very dangerous, that may cost you some joy. It was uh, Shane Beamer who said, find some joy. We got a reason for you to maybe pay attention to this. That's coming up next here on Wire to Wire, a brand new show here on the Fan Upstate. I'm Diesel. He's Cole Bryson. And we will be right back.
Winning is fun. Believe it or not, your team winning is a lot of fun. But, Cole, there is one negative side effect to winning, especially winning too much. What? Yeah. I'm going to tell you why winning too much is a bad thing. Because it creates a championship or bust mindset, and that is very, very, very dangerous for fans. Has no real effect on the team. Let's let's be real. None of this actually affects the players. You, some dude bitching and moaning on Twitter that your team's not winning enough games. Tyler. Or they're not winning <laughs> with uh, the margin of victory that you would prefer. That doesn't actually have any effect on the team. I mean, it may eventually like get into some bullet bulletin board material. It may annoy the F out of the coach. But outside of that, it's not really affecting the players and how they perform. But what it does do is it steals your joy. It is a thief of your joy. Like there are programs all over this country who have found tremendous amounts of success, Cole. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Kentucky <clears throat> basketball. I'm thinking Georgia football, Alabama football, North Dakota State football. Like those guys are bored. Those guys are ripping people apart week in and week out up there in the dome in Fargo. Mm -hmm. And their attendance is going down. I mean, they're, they're blowing teams out week in and week out, but their attendance is going down because they're like, ho-hum, it's boring. Winning by 30 every game. Yawn, not that into it anymore. To them, college football has become a playoff only sport. I can't believe we're talking about this right now, saying that winning is. I mean, I don't disagree with Maybe you. Maybe it's good for the fans. See, I ripped Dabo Sweeney when he was saying things like, maybe we should lose a couple of games. Maybe it'd be good for the fan base. <laughs> He's right. You're part of the problem. He was right. Maybe. <laughs> They've won too damn much. They've been too damn good. I do think this. And you <sighs> haven't figured out how to deal with it. So I do like, I absolutely do think there's truth to it. Yeah. What is interesting is I think this is a perfect example of what happened to Clemson football. I really yeah. do. Um, when you say you enter championship or bust territory, I think, what locally, what I'll think of is what Davo said in terms of winning at Clemson. It, and this was when Tyler called into his program. He, I can't remember exactly verbatim how he worded it, Diesel, but he said Clemson fans used to be appreciative, right? And and I, the expectations, whether he likes it or not, the expectations bit him in the butt because. He created a culture of staying at the top, being at the top and staying at the top, being all in. And, and the moment that that turned sideways, it showed that this theory that you bring up of winning, creating a dangerous mindset. I, I think it, I think it, I hate to say it. I can't believe I never thought I'd say this, but it, I think it's true. I think it yeah. does. Well, if you get, if you get to the point as a fan where only one outcome makes you happy. Only winning a national championship makes you happy. I mean, like, you guys realize the whole point of sports is to win by one point, right? Mm -hmm. That's all you got to do. All you have to do is win by one point. But fans don't like that. That's if winning by one point is not good enough. If you're Clemson, you beat Georgia Tech by one, not good enough. You got to beat Georgia Tech by 30. Yeah. Well, first of all, scoring 30 points in college football is hard. Mm -hmm. That's hard. You got to score four touchdowns to get that. So. <sighs> I think this mindset of championship or bust, I think it's fascinating because I think of teams like the Milwaukee Bucks and the Cowboys of 95. How about the NBA and the Warriors and the run they went on? Sure. Well, the reason I bring the Bucks up is they win a championship. And I'll even go back one further than that. And with Ty Lue in Cleveland, you win a championship and then the very next year you're canned. Yeah. Happened with Ty Lue, yeah. happened with Mike Budenholzer in Milwaukee, won a championship, next year he's gone. Um, happened in Dallas. Obviously, the crazy moronic owner had something to do with that with Jimmy Johnson. But, like, I think this conversation that you bring up 
also spawns another conversation of after you win a championship with that guy, do you ride with that guy until you die, or do you have the mindset of bringing somebody else in to continue that we success? Saw it with Kentucky, Calipari won one. He's getting yeah. his team into the tournament every year, but that's not good enough. So no. that's what's that's another fascinating side to that is when you get it is. when you get ownership or an athletic director who who ha, who understands having a winning culture. Think about think about the Lakers, for example. Think about the Celtics. You know these franchises, these storied franchises, not you Cowboys, uh, that have won. Uh, for decades and decades, and they know what it's like. It's yeah. ingrained in them to be a winning franchise. It's almost odd that those those entities are willing to give mediocre coaches, not mediocre by their standards, more time to figure it out. So they've entered this, uh, it, it's not even a championship or bust mindset. It's a uh, championship or, hey, do pretty good. We'll keep extending you. Because you know what, you know, it, it, we 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 realize how hard it is to win. Um, I don't know, man. I, college football, Alabama, like it's so. This is so iffy because Diesel, Alabama won so many times with the same head coach. Yeah, that doesn't happen no. a lot. I will say that. When you do win, it creates a culture that you do have to live up to the expectations. However, I don't like when a coach, after he's won, I don't like when a coach comes back and says, well, you have unreal, unrealistic expectations. The problem with that is you created those expectations. And then that's where I go back to Clemson. Well, the crazy thing is, so I, I if we want to keep this just football, yeah, uh, just college football, I went back and I looked at the – the college football playoff era. Sure. And I went back and I looked at starting with Ohio state in 2014, where it won the first ever college football playoff. And then I looked to see what's their expectations. How, do they fall off after winning a national championship? And outside of LSU who won the national championship in 2019 and their precipitous fall off in 2020 and 2021, Mm-hmm. Almost everybody on this list who's won a national championship from 2014 to 2020, and I chose 2020, that way we'd have three years of results leading up to now. Yeah. Most of these teams have stayed right there. Ohio State never fell outside finishing a season in the top six. Alabama finished a season eighth, two years after winning a national championship in 2017. Clemson fell to 14th in 2021, their final finishing ranking. LSU is the only one of this bunch who fell outside of the top 15 mm -hmm. in a three-year span. So the results are still there. They sure. are still winning an awful lot of football games. Most of these teams are ending up back in the playoff again uh, in the years following their national championships. But fans at these schools, the, the weird thing about it, Cole, is fans at these schools are miserable. Like Ohio State fans are miserable because they can't beat Michigan. Yeah. Because they can't get back and win another national championship. Alabama fans, they're not miserable, but they're certainly worried about what Kalen DeBoer is going to be able to do. Is he going to be able to keep up with what Nick Saban did? I mean, I'm going to be real with you, Alabama fans. Nobody's going to keep up with what, what with what Nick Saban did. Kalen DeBoer, I think, has all the pieces to have another fantastic run at Alabama. But can he put it all together with the consistency of Nick Saban? That's really tough. I think it's a great question. Clemson fans are terrified that Dabo is slipping. Sure. LSU might be the only team in that bunch who's won a national championship in the last decade who are happy with the results because they're on the climb back up. Right. They know that, that they know that the journey is what makes it fun. You got to maybe lose a little bit to make the winning feel fun again. Madcraft says, I don't think you necessarily have to keep winning at all, just as long as we've considered the top, as we are considered the top team in the league year in and year out. At least I agree with that. You do at least have to be in contention. All right, coming up next, we're going to hit the daily wires today, as well as get into what happened yesterday with the Masters and Diesel and I's opinion on if Scotty Scheffler can be the next Tiger Woods.
Many, many headlines to get to. However, we don't call them headlines on this show, Wire to Wire. We call them Daily Wires, Diesel. We've got to keep it electric. Yeah, I was going to say, give me your best buzz. Hey, I like it. The Wire to Wire goes well with the new Infinity Sports Buzz Lightyear Network. <laughs> Didn't plan that, but uh, that's just the way it works out. Infinity and below. Oh, I mean, man. Beyond. beyond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it right the first that's time. It. All right. Uh, some daily wires to get to. The WNBA draft is tonight. Caitlin Clark is expected to go numero uno. We expect that to happen, right? I don't know. I might have to look before the end of the show to see what the betting odds are on that, but that would be seem like a good bet to get in on if it's reasonable. How how ludicrous would it be if the Indiana Fever did not draft Caitlin Clark first? <laughs> It'd be great. It'd be hilarious. It would absolutely be hilarious. This would be uh, this would be Akeem Olajuwon and Sam Bowie. Oh, being picked before Michael Jordan. I mean, it'd, it'd be not, bad. Not to say that Akeem Olajuwon didn't have a great career, right? <laughs> but like, would would anybody be dumb enough to make that mistake again? Like, there's no reason in any way, shape, or form to believe that Caitlin Clark will not be a, a great in women's professional basketball. I'm going to try to I, find. I do wonder, though, Cole. Do you, I mean, obviously, with year one, with all of the craziness coming off of the uh, NCAA tournament and riding the wave of women's college basketball, mm-hmm. um, there's no reason to believe that there won't be a huge influx of viewers to the WNBA. You said it last week. What was it 38 of 40? Yeah. Indiana Fever games are going to be on television this year yeah. on national TV, which is nuts. I just wonder what's going to happen in years two, three, four of Caitlin Clark's career. Will, That's a good question. Will, I mean, she if she has a great uh, rookie season, that's great. But, I mean, is there going to be this, this fever pitch of coverage to keep it afloat? It's a good question. Uh, also, today earlier in the program, we broke this. Uh, it did just come out. Lexington star, five-star Cam Scott, who was committed to Texas, has decommitted from Texas. And in his tweet, not speculating, but in his tweet, he hinted, and said that he wants to be closer to family. Who was number two on uh, Cam Scott's recruiting radar? It was Lamont Paris. So things could get really, really spicy over the next few weeks. That would be That's gonna ginormous. Be big pressure on Brad Brown. Big Brad Brad. Big Brad Brad. <laughs> who AI me said I would never say anything bad about Brad Brownell again. <laughs> ah, that's great. Um, also, Atlanta took two of three from Miami over the weekend. It did get hairy yesterday as Atlanta won nine to seven. They won eight to one in uh, Friday's game, and then they lost Saturday five to one. Here's what the ending to yesterday's game sounded like. Runners go. Ozuna hits it in the air to left center. Chisholm back. It's gone! The Big Bear with a big fly. The Braves down to their final strike. And Ozuna, who owns Miami, strikes again. Man, that's terrific. That is yeah, absolutely crazy. terrific. It really is. Um, the NBA regular season ended yesterday. So the play-in games start Tuesday, and that brings up something that we haven't talked about yet. Diesel is fixing to find out how much I nerd out for the NBA playoffs. Um, that's one thing that you may already know a little bit that I do love. But when the I NBA, I genuinely didn't know the NBA playoffs were coming up. Well, I um, I'm one of the few because NBA around here is not as popular as it is in major markets, right? However, what? <laughs> yeah, shocker. I absolutely love the NBA playoffs. So I'll be locked in. I have my Luca shirt on today. For those on the stream, it's faded, but it's still Luca. I would 100% be willing to jump into Hornets fever if the Hornets oh, got good. No doubt. No doubt. I want it so bad. Me too. I'm not going to spend my time paying attention to a garbage team. Maybe that'll change. Maybe it will. <laughs> uh, Clemson baseball. They did not have a good weekend. They lost the series to NC State Friday, eleven to eight. NC State Saturday, four to zero. NC State, and then Clemson did win on Sunday, 
They did not allow the sweep. Saturday's 4-0 loss for Clemson was the first time Clemson has not scored a uh, run in a game since 2022. South Carolina, however, they're trending in the opposite direction. Last week, they took down UNC, a really quality win. This week, they go to Gainesville, take two of three from Florida, 10-3 to three, uh, Friday, 9-8, to eight, and a comeback win on Saturday. And then Sunday, they lost 11-9. And then maybe this is the uh, Daily Wire, the headline diesel for if you live under a rock. Scotty Scheffler, <clears throat> excuse me, Scotty Scheffler won the 2024 Masters. He has now won two of the last three. Not too shabby. We'll get into dominance. Yeah, that is dominance. Dominance from Scotty Scheffler. I, I just saw this graphic. You'd already seen it. Scotty Scheffler <laughs> has earned $12.653 million in tournament winnings alone. Over the last 36 days, somebody Do math, he's making $351,000 a day. You think he can afford that new baby he's having? Yeah, yeah, he could afford a, a whole <laughs> mess of babies. Um, I mean, what's really going to stink is when he gets his tax bill at the end of the year. 300000 a day for 35 days. I think I would probably save one of those days for the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, by the way, did you get your taxes done? I did last night. There you last go. night. I did wait it until the last minute. Do you always wait to the last minute? Uh, now we're getting personal. Well, I had a file too, one for me personally and one for my small business. Yeah. And that took a lot longer than I thought. So, uh, I was, uh, yeah, that was not a fun experience last night. I could not be a CPA for a living. Just FYI. Uh, Chase Elliott yesterday snapped a 42-race winless drought with his win at Texas Motor Speedway. I did tune in for the last, I don't know, 50 laps, and it seemed like the last 40 took an hour and a half. There was restart after restart after restart after wreck after wreck after wreck. It was funny, though. Denny Hamlin did, uh, right, I think with just a few laps to go, Denny Hamlin did have a chance to win it, and he uh, spun out. He got spun out. Chase Elliott gave him a little shove, and, Denny no more yesterday. And then lastly, the Hornets won a game. So what? we put it on the headlines. Uh, wow. They beat the Cavaliers to end the regular season, 120 to 110 yesterday. In the final game of the regular season, stellar record this year for Hornets fans. Charlotte 21 and 61, 13th in the East. Diesel, that was the last game yesterday for Coach Clifford, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. So now the news turns to who are the Hornets going to hire? a very good question and we didn't mention this uh but just more connections forming between the uh between the Iowa and South Carolina basketball programs last year Aliyah Boston was the first overall pick to the Indiana Fever second straight year that the yeah. Fever have had the number 1 overall pick Aliyah Boston from South Carolina she averaged in 2023 uh, 14 and a half points a game 8 and a half rebounds per game two and a quarter assists. So a, a decent rookie season for Aliyah Boston in the WNBA. So, I mean, just forming those connections, we saw, uh, we'll play the audio here for you again, uh, but we did have um, some audio of Caitlin Clark on Saturday Night Live. As a matter of fact, you know what? Let's do play it. Uh, Caitlin Clark on Saturday Night Live this past weekend, uh, she took some shots at Michael Che, the, the uh, co-host of Weekend Update, but she, on her way out, she did uh, throw a lot of shout outs to a lot of big <laughs> names, especially a couple from the South Carolina program. So if you're wondering just how much it means to her, the, the battles that she's had with South Carolina over the past couple of seasons, it really matters. Listen to this. Good luck in the WNBA. I hope you have a great first season. Thanks. I'm sure it will be a big first step for me, but it's just one step for the WNBA. Thanks to all the great players like Cheryl Swoops, Lisa Leslie, Cynthia Cooper, the great Don Staley, and my basketball hero, Maya Moore. These are the women that kicked down the door so I could walk inside. So I want to thank them tonight for laying the foundation. And Michael, since you're such a big fan, I brought you a souvenir. It's an apron signed by me. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, thank you. I, I can't wait to give this to my girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. The context there is at the very beginning of that segment, Michael Che said that Iowa was retiring her jersey and handing her an apron. Oof. Oof. Big shot there from Michael Che. Um, is that a test or is are we really under a um, – That's a test. Okay. That's gotcha. A test. 
I was like, man, it sure is nice and pretty outside for us to be oh, under actually, a severe. We are, we are under. A... Are we? I guess so. Read that screen. El Servicio. <laughs> El Servicio <laughs> Meteorologico. Uh, yeah. Uh, Greenville so, County, it's 6 o'clock, effective until 6.50. Is it storming? It uh, looks pretty gorgeous to me outside right now. Let us know if you're yes. on a different side of town. 84 degrees, not a cloud in the sky, maybe a little hazy in some areas, huh. but that's odd. On these daily wires, before we get back to the Masters, yesterday, I don't know if you saw this, Diesel, I love players who care about the people. Yep. Houston Rockets Center, I've had this audio queued up. Boban Morhanovic purposely missed a free throw yesterday in the game. So that the fans would receive what? Free chicken. Here's the audio. Fans are getting excited here. There might potentially be some free chicken on the board if he misses the second free throw. Oh man, free chicken on the board. Yeah, so that's why the fans are getting a little, little floppy. <laughs> oh, they're pointing to the ball on play with the crowd and saying, You want chicken? Here's your job. Oh, he gave him chicken. He's a man of the people. <laughs> He's a man of the people. You did that on purpose? He did. He gave out free chicken. Is so that he, not incredible, he's on the man? Team, right? He was he plays for Houston. I don't know if I don't know if they were home or not, but that was <laughs> absolutely great. <laughs> and the best part was he heard the crowd and that's cheating. So he cheated. <laughs> this chicken is tainted. Man, you gotta love it though. What, what do we what did we just talk about last week <laughs> with Charlie Baker? He's trying to get player props out of college basketball because he doesn't want players colluding and making things happen. This is collusion, Cole. This is cheating. I love it. I love it. Cheating for chicken. Cheating for chicken. <laughs> and I'd be willing to bet. Like, I wonder I, I wonder how much like, – I'm doubting that it probably came from uh, – that it came from, like, the concession stands. It's probably, like, coupons. But so this sure. guy – this guy just cost some local restaurant – Oh, yeah. Thousands of dollars – in chicken. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. That's a man of the people. That's my kind of guy right there. He's a man it's of the cheating. people. All right. Yesterday, Diesel, you and I watched the Masters with uh, Rob Brown. Rob Brown and his fiance graciously welcomed us into their home, mm, which was a risk. Yeah. It was a risk. You know, uh, me and you going to their home, a big risk. But they let us in. And we watched the Masters. I think what is so interesting is I was having this conversation with a friend of mine who's a big golf guy yesterday. Golf guy loves the way yesterday went because yesterday was pure dominance. Scotty Scheffler ran shop on everybody in the Masters yesterday. So golf guy is looking at it from a perspective of this is absolutely incredible. This is great golf. This is dominating. This is the best thing I've ever seen. However, non-golf guy, I'm raising my hand for those on the stream or that, that aren't on the stream, non-golf guy, me, Diesel, sees that yesterday and thinks, ah, I don't know what I'm supposed to be excited about. He's absolutely running shop. I mean, he did. it did get a three. I think there was a three-way tie you know, on the front nine, and then after the back nine, he just kind of turned it on. So my point is, yesterday's Masters, for golf guy, they loved it. For non-golf guy who's wanting to get into the sport more, there wasn't much to intrigue. Drama. I need a drama. Need I needed a, drama. a I needed I don't even want to say a playoff. I just needed it get it, I needed it to at least get to the 17th, 18th. And so so what you're saying is you don't it's not interesting enough to you to get into it just based on Elite play no, by itself. it's not because I'm not a golf guy. And I understand, however, I do understand that his play is really, really elite. Like, what Scotty Scheffler is doing right now is incredible. I understand that. Yeah, his consistency is up there on par with Tiger's yeah. level of consistency in the 90s. Sure. Yeah, like There are guys around him who can stick with him for a round or two, but they're not able to do what he's doing day in and day out. So that's my that's my I don't want to say issue because I don't want to ever sound like I'm saying there's an issue with the Masters. It's a great event. However, I say the same thing about NASCAR. You don't want Denny Hamlin leading by a lap with eight laps to go, you know? Like you want some drama, you want something to come down to the wire. 
And as good as Scheffler was yesterday, um, I just didn't find myself as intrigued as I thought I would. Scheffler's a phenomenal player. We talked about in the very first segment how Diesel and your and I, in our opinion, this is very similar to Michael Jordan's era in Washington for Tiger. Hmm. Not Scheffler, obviously, <laughs> but for Tiger, right? Everybody yesterday who was watching the Masters, and, and, and people might push back on this, Diesel, but I do believe that for the most part, the majority of people watching yesterday, they were disappointed that Tiger wasn't in the final round. Oh, yeah, we're all watching, hoping that, that an aging golfer who's, who's 20 years past his prime or 10 years past his prime in this sport can show us some magic again, right? That's yeah. what we all hope to see. It's not what we got. His, his third round is what put Tiger so far back in the hole that there was no way he was coming back from that. Uh, 73, 72 on days one and two. Uh, so one over par on, on Thursday, even par on Friday. Shot an 83, plus 11, 83 on Saturday and a plus 577 on Sunday. That plus 577 is not, it's not an awful round of mm. golf. Um, I, I would bet you if, if Tiger could, uh, could say, all right, I'm going to hover right there in that plus five range uh, for a round or two, like my worst rounds, he would take that every day. But that 83 is what really hurt him. It was his highest score in his career. A, a, an event where he made the cut, played all the way through Sunday. It was his highest score ever as a pro, a 16 over 304, broke his uh, career worst, which was a 302 at the Memorial in 2015. So this is a two-part question I have for you and for the audience. Tolos, that stands for turn it on, leave it on. 71307, start your text with the word fan. Phone lines are open as well, 844-FAN-PHONE. Diesel, two-part question. First part is, is it fair to say that Tiger is now in that Michael Washington Wizards era? Yeah. And the second part is, when it relates to Tiger, is it time for him to call it a quits? Uh, no, I, I mean, Tiger Tiger is still, I don't care what anybody says, Tiger Woods is still not the anymore, but he's definitely a face of golf. He's probably still one of the top three uh, biggest earners for golf just based on who he is and what he's accomplished in his past. Yeah. So, you know, I, I look at Tiger and say he's got the right to trot out there and play as sure. often as he, he can. He earned it, buddies, right? He's earned it. I mean, God, we saw we saw Fred Couples out there, um, whom I, I think Fred Couples made the cut. I could be wrong there, um, but Fred Couples was in the field. That's the, that's my point. He yeah. was in the field, um, and Tiger by making the cut broke his tie with Fred Couples and um, uh, forgetting who the other player was. Broke his tie with them for twenty four consecutive Masters made. So shout out to him for what uh, it was Gary player, Gary player and Fred couples uh, and tiger were all tied at 23, him making the cut, got him to 24. So he now holds the longest streak ever. I mean, Scotty Scheffler, maybe not knocking down his back door one day. Sure. We'll see. But you know, tiger can go out there and, and still be a big draw 10 years from now on the pro. You think so? Wants. Yeah. I mean, I, I would be willing to bet that the seriousness with which Tiger takes the Masters and the fact that he says, man, I, I know I'm not hitting the ball the way that I used to, but I know this course like the back of my hand. I think that by itself will probably, if he wants it, will probably you know have Tiger making another cut or two you know, next year and the year after. I, yeah. I think Tiger could push this record – to 25, 26, 27, if he really wanted to, if he really focused on, on doing just that. Well, I mean, are we ever going to see Tiger in contention for a major again? Probably not. I mean, maybe for a round, maybe he'll have a, just an insane first round where he finishes a couple of shots under. And we're like, oh my God, Tiger is three, four shots off the lead. Could this be it? Could this be the magic? We all want to see that happen, right? We, we're all yeah. begging for it and hoping for it. Well, Tiger making the four-day tournament. No, and, and that's my point. Tiger making the cut doesn't seem as far-fetched to me because making the cut's a lot different than finishing in the fourth round sure. well. 
you don't have to go the entire uh, tournament. Now, here's what's interesting. We talked about this in the very first segment of the show. Will the 15-year-old Charlie Woods have to enter the PGA Tour? Because he will one day, you would think. Will he have to enter the PGA Tour with the weight on his shoulders of, hey, it's up to you to be the next Popeye. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that's tough, man. Um, think about the pressure that that kid has on him. Hey, could you imagine? Do you think Tiger would caddy for his son at these courses? I couldn't tell you of anybody else. I, you know, and I'm sure Charlie has coaches out the wazoo, right? The sure. best of the best. Yeah. Uh, but does would Tiger trust anyone else to go out and caddy for his son, but himself? So Paige, and I'm going to mess his last name up on Twitter. Spearnack, Paige Spearnack, when talking about Charlie yesterday. Her, she. Paige Spearnack is a she. Yes. When, you, said, you said his. I'm sorry. When uh, when talking about Charlie Woods. Yeah. Um, she said yesterday on Twitter, how about we let Charlie Woods develop his game without constant media coverage? Golf is mentally challenging enough without all the added eyeballs on him and the pressure. That's my point. As he yeah. gets older – and starts qualifying, the pressure is going to be stupid ridiculous. I mean, for someone who is really good at getting eyeballs on herself in golf, she would know. <laughs> we all we all know. We all know why Paige Spearnack is. Diesel, is why? Famous. Can you tell us why? Because she is insanely hot. <laughs> insanely hot. Now, apparently, she's a, a fairly good golfer. Not great. Not like, you know, not good enough to be playing on the, you know, LPGA. But yeah. she's she's a good golfer. I mean, you look at you look at caddies. You realize caddies have to be great golfers too. Yeah, like there's a they re- do. No, they're, they do. They're great golfers. They have to know this game inside and out too. And they're they're both they have to be great golfers. They have to be great golf coaches. They have to be psychologists getting in these guys' ears. Uh, I, I, what did we see? There was a graphic. Um, uh, it wasn't about uh, it wasn't about this uh, Scotty Scheffler. You know, and his. Twelve and a half million dollars he's earned over the last thirty six days. There was something about his caddy who's earned himself like a million and a half. Well, here's here's what's past. even more interesting about that. Yeah. To the caddy point, Rory, his earnings at the Masters because he didn't play well. I saw a graphic this morning where his caddy, not by much, but his caddy earned more than he did. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not painful or what? Oh, that is painful. And didn't he win the par three? No. Who won no, the par three? That was. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know I why think, I'm. I think Ricky Fowler won the par. Oh, three. did he? I don't know why I was thinking Rory, but I believe you're right with Ricky. Um, another interesting note. Yeah, Ricky Fowler won the par three. Ricky did. Uh, one more interesting note before we hit a break. Charlie Woods is 15 years old. You know how old Papa was when he won his first star. Or, I'm sorry, let me back up. How old Papa Woods was on his first PGA Tour? 16. Okay. So Charlie's uh, knocking on the door of, all right, it's time. Let's so, go. I'm gonna, I am gonna. I don't know where he is in his career and his development right now, but we have several local golfers here who are young golfers who are really, really good. One of them has a famous Papa of, of his own, Clemson Tom. Everybody knows Clemson Tom, right? You know sure. Clemson Tom. Sure. His son plays golf. His son is elite, elite. Really? Very, very good. We we had him on the show. We've had him on the, the fan upstate a couple of times. And his son is competing against and beating Charlie Woods in tournaments all over the no world. No way. Yeah. So I didn't know that. We'll see. I, I'm I'm interested to know. You know, we haven't caught up with with Tom in a while. I haven't either, man. It's been a while since yeah. I've talked to him. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's taking a step back. He's a family man now. He's sure. taking a step back from from the public eye. He's still out there doing his thing, but not, yeah. not the, what he used to do. Uh, but, you know, apparently his son is really good, and I would love to know. Uh, we might have to catch up with him soon. We might have to. Yeah. Might have to. All right, Diesel. Uh, next segment, let's get to this Kentucky basketball portal dump because this is not good for Kentucky. Yeah, who was Cal talking about when he said, I met with the team? There is no team. I think he's talking about his new team and his old team. Look at that. Cal destroying two rosters 
at once. <laughs> yeah. Join us. Don't forget, join us next Thursday for our draft show. We're going to be live at David Buster's at Woodruff Road in Greenville from 3 to 7. <laughs> It's Wire to Wire. I'm Diesel. He is Cole Bryson. Again, a reminder to join us next Thursday. We'll be live with David Busters from 3 to 7 Woodruff Road for our draft special draft coverage. Anish Shroff, voice, uh, play-by-play voice of the Carolina Panthers, will join us live on the show. Let's go. That's awesome. Yeah. I love Anish, man. I What, what he does and what play-by-play guys do just blows me away mm-hmm. every time. Like you, We're talking like... Anisha's calling like a Thursday game 
He'll call a Saturday game, and then he'll call the Panthers on Sunday. Yeah. How do you keep that many names, that many stats straight? That was wild. It blows me away what he's able to do. I Play by play fascinates me. I've never done it. I would love to give it a shot. I think I'd be horrible at it, but I'd give it a shot anyway. Mm-hmm. Like just because I'm going to be bad at it doesn't mean I'm not going to try it. Absolutely. Like that way with me in the bedroom. I still <laughs> love it. So there you go. What is happening at Kentucky? Every second, every chance I look down at my phone, Diesel, I'm getting a notification that says another Kentucky player named so and so, so and so this time has hit the portal. How do they have any freshmen left on the roster to leave? Five hours ago, the latest, Aaron Bradshaw dumping from Kentucky to Ohio State. It's happened almost three days in a row. DJ Wagner hit the portal. Yeah. Um, DJ Wagner was one of their top commits. Here's what I think is going to happen at Kentucky. I, I truly believe that Mark Pope is a stopgap because – they couldn't get the, the guys that they really wanted. They couldn't mm-hmm. get Hurley to leave Connecticut. They couldn't get uh, the coach out of Alabama. They couldn't get Billy Donovan. So they settle for Mark Pope. And, like, things could go well for Mark Pope at Kentucky. He'll sure. have more resources, more attention, more everything than he's ever had before. And, obviously, he's he played at Kentucky, so he knows the culture, right? He's been there before. Yeah. But if he's not the guy to take Kentucky to get Kentucky back to winning national championships quickly, mm-hmm. I I I think he's just going to be that guy who's there for two seasons maybe, and Gosh. then they can go out and hire the next guy like the best coach available at the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I think unless he's unless he's uh, you know in the in the Sweet 16 next year, he's already on the hot seat after one season. I, I don't think Kentucky faithful are going to give him a whole lot of time yeah. to figure it out. And I have to go back and look at what he did at BYU. I, BYU is a different case because I don't think BYU is bringing in a lot of transfers mm-hmm. to, uh, to to Utah there. But uh, I, I, think, I think he's going to be there for a season, two seasons, three seasons, tops. And then, you know, maybe they – are then able to get, uh, you know, an elite coach to defect from their from their school and come to Kentucky. You know, it, I said this last week. I wasn't sold on the Mark Pope hire last week, and I'm not really sold on it even today. Now that I've had about a week to think about it, um, whether you liked Cal or not, he was a pipeline to the NBA. And I think that now that he's gone, the the kids that he recruited there are probably thinking, well, the pipeline of the NBA is gone. Well, he's got to get them back to see like what Mark or what uh, Calipari did benefited the players and benefited the NBA. Sure, it didn't benefit Kentucky. Absolutely, and and that's the problem. It, yeah. it, I mean, he never had a team that was old enough um, to hang in there and compete in the tournament because. Like this year when he went against an older team, uh, the guy, I can't remember his name, who hit a million threes that game, just uh, absolutely lit him up. So I don't know. You say only two to three years. Yeah, I, I don't think that that Mark Pope is going to be there long term. You know, again, he, he may surprise some people. He may have a better – a better go of it at Kentucky than a lot of people think he will. And and I hope he does. I, you know, I love seeing, you know, the, the guy who uh, is an alum who comes back, who, who clearly is going to love Kentucky and is going to pour his all into Kentucky. I love seeing those guys do well, but I, I don't genuinely see, I don't genuinely see it happening. And I don't see him getting any longer of a leash because he's a Kentucky guy. I think it's fascinating. I hope that they can get a few years out of them, but boy, oh boy, if it goes sideways and it goes sour quick, um, they may be in. I, I don't wish it on them, but I, I just wasn't sold on them from the very beginning. I wasn't. Yeah, he he could do. I think he he'll, he'll do fine. But yeah, fine is not good enough. Not at Kentucky. Kentucky. It's not. All right, uh, Kevin wants to chime in on the conversation here to, on wire to wire. What's up, Kevin? Don't do 
fine. But fine is not good enough. Not a Tim's Cup. It's not. All right. Kevin, hey, Kevin, let's turn your radio down there from us. Of course, pal. Kevin, you got us? Hey, Cole, you know what's uh, coming to the end of the month? What's up, man? Hey, Cole. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Sorry I about can. that. You're good. We had we ha- we heard the radio, but uh, now that the radio's right. down, we've got you loud and clear. All right. So end end of the month. I just need to know from uh, the biggest Dallas Cowboy fan that I know, who are the Cowboys going to draft? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Well, l- l- let me ask it. Th- let me ask again. What do the Cowboys need to draft? Okay, that's a great question. Um. Kevin, appreciate the call. I'll, I'm going to hang up with you, and I'll answer so you can hear me on air, okay? Okay. Well, I'll say this. Since Kevin wants to talk about my uh, love-hate relationship with Cowboys, Diesel, what the Cowboys need to draft versus what they will draft, they have drafted pretty well over the years, but I do think that the loss to Green Bay in the playoffs – showed that you need a true linebacker more than you realize. Now, you have DeMar Overshawn from Texas who got hurt in the preseason last year. You have him coming back. So you'll have a pretty good linebacker in Overshawn who's supposed to be really good. Um, But I know that in the audience out there, we do have a lot of Cowboy fans because they're everywhere. And, um, you know, we stick together because we have to be miserable with friends, right? I think they need linebackers more than anything. Uh, Green Bay last year in the playoffs – they ran shop on Dallas's defense. They really showed that Dallas could not stop the run. The, the, the lack thereof of the linebackers for Dallas was the biggest concern for me going into the playoffs, and it showed. So I would say to answer your question, Kevin, uh, Dallas really needs a linebacker. I think they need help at the corner safety position. Uh, Trayvon Diggs' injury last year showed that when he's not there, uh, Stephon Gilmore – couldn't do it on his own. He's old. I don't even know where he is. I think he's still a free agent. I don't even know if anybody signed Stephon Gilmore yet, so it'll be interesting to see. But I think their focus should be on defense. Um, and then, as I said, a cornerback or a safety, a uh, linebacker, and then what are you going to do at running back? You didn't bring um, anybody in during free agency. You had a chance with Derrick Henry, but you didn't do anything. So I don't know, you know, I <laughs> Sadly, I don't have faith in, in Dallas anymore. I just don't. I've come to realize that they're, Dallas is going to Dallas, right? Sadly, I just uh, I don't have a ton of faith. Not, uh, as of right now, Stephon Gilmore is still with the Cowboys. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think, uh, I think they're going to have to work something out with him. So to answer your question, Kevin, I'd go linebacker, I'd go corner, and then I'd go running back. But they do have holes. We'll talk about it a ton the week of the draft. We're going to try to do our best to uh, diesel hit on all the teams that we care about here in the upstate who our listeners want us to talk about in terms of who should draft who. I can't wait. I love the NFL draft. It's one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. All right, last segment. Coming up next, the NBA regular season is over. I love the NBA playoffs. I'm a huge NBA playoff fan, and I'm going to encourage you to be a fan with me next. He's Diesel. I'm Cole Bryson, and this is Wire to Wire.
So, Diesel, the NBA playoffs are now about to get underway. The NBA regular season ended yesterday. And one storyline that is super fascinating is the play-in tournament. I think one of the best things the NBA ever did was implement the play-in games, right? It's the 7 through 10 seeds. And it's one or, you know, do or die, one or done, right? One thing that's super interesting, the Los Angeles Lakers, take on tomorrow night the Pelicans, who they just played yesterday and beat by like 20, 25. So here's the scenario where this really gets kind of tricky because I have some Mike Greenberg audio. And for the first time in a long time, I actually agree with Mike Greenberg. So if the Lakers win tomorrow diesel against New Orleans, they will have to play in the playoffs once the playoffs get there, they'll have to play Denver. And everyone knows Denver's the best team in the league, right? No one wants to play Denver. However, if they were to lose tomorrow, it would force a one-game do-or-die on Wednesday against Sacramento or Golden State. And if they win that game, they would play the Thunder. The Thunder, obviously a much younger team. For whatever reason, Los Angeles Lakers have not been able to defeat um, Jokic and the Nuggets. So Mike Greenberg this morning says this. I'm going to say something in duck because I know that it is controversial and I know that it flies in the face of absolutely everything that the spirit of competition <laughs> was born to create. And you just said, Herman Edwards, you play to win the game. The Lakers should not play tomorrow night. They should not play LeBron. They should not play AD. They do not want to be the seven seed. You want to be the eight. I'm taking my chances in a one and done at home against either Sacramento or Golden State and go in against the very young OKC Thunder in round one instead of going into the buzzsaw that is Denver. I think you were, it is worth the risk. Everything you said is right, except for one thing. You put yourself into a one-off situation. Okay, where you lose one game and you're going home for the summer if you lose that second night, right? This is different with the Knicks. You're talking about win or lose to, uh, determines your seeding. Right. You still have a best of seven series you're about to go play, right? And event, the better team will win that series. This is different. Like You lose that game intentionally. You put yourself into a situation where you're playing the winner of the 9-10 and anything could happen. If somebody gets hurt. Somebody gets in foul trouble. Somebody just – D'Angelo Russell goes one for 14. Like, there's all, so many things could happen in one game. Yes. And you find yourself going home for the summer. I recognize so – I think that's a little bit more precarious. I recognize the risk. But I think life is about assessing risk mm. reward. Is it worth that risk to avoid playing Denver in round one or two? There's no one who can – look, the, the Nuggets are the one team the Lakers have – All no right, so I'm going to fade the audio out. Yeah. Is it ludicrous – to say that they should intentionally sit LeBron and AD tomorrow night to get the better seed, which would diesel force a one game on Wednesday where you have to win to get in the playoffs. This is what this is what a lot of people feared <laughs> with the expanding college football playoff. They thought teams were going to lose games so that they late so that they wouldn't have to play in the conference championship game and potentially push them out of the, <laughs> like it, these scenarios are mind bending, right? They are. You have to, I, I don't think you can take that risk. That's a huge risk. It, it is. It is. But like, if you feel like this is what you need to do just to get in, you're admitting that you have no chance to actually win the thing. And I, 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 I'm with you. I'm with you because uh, they're in the play. So anti-competent. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. See, this is what happens. This is why people are getting so fed up with sports <laughs> because we're creating different uh, different tournaments to get in late. We're used to seeing the best of five, best of seven format once we get into the playoffs. But, oh, no, now we're going to go back to sort of a, a mini NCAA tournament scenario. <laughs> and, it, like, you're, you're, you're tinkering far too much. OK, tinkering far too much, trying to set things up so that the best teams get buys. Well, what do you do now? Because you've got an uneven number of teams in the playoffs, Yeah. And it's just weird. Like, I hate this. 
as a traditionalist kind of fan, <laughs> I hate this. I hate college, the college football 14 team set up with now automatic tie-ins. I hate it. Just just get in the damn tournament and win your games. Right? So let I, the best team win. <laughs> Stop with this. You get buys because you earned it over the course of a season. Just cool it with this stuff. Now, I don't think the Lakers will actually do this. I don't think there's any way in the world. I think there's like a 1% chance that Darvin Ham would arrest AD and LeBron because you have been playing, arguably the Lakers have been playing some of the best basketball in the last month than any other team. You cannot risk the entire season coming down to one game on Wednesday night. While this is very fascinating, while this is, when you think about it, it's like, it does make sense, but it doesn't, right? It's one of those Keep things. Keep it that, simple, stupid. Stop trying to get cute. Stop trying to game But the there's system. no chance they beat Denver. <laughs> well, but you just said they're playing the best basketball of the season. I know. I know. Denver's just a different Hello. animal, man. You play to win the game. <laughs> Jeez, I can't stand. That. I don't know if it'll happen. I can't, I can't stand the sight of this. All right, so the play-in um, Wednesday or Tuesday and Wednesday. So the other play-in games are, as I'm pulling it up right now, great radio. Okay, uh, L.A. and New Orleans Tuesday night at seven thirty. The next play-in game is at ten o'clock Tuesday night, which is Golden State and Sacramento. So the Lakers Pelicans is a seventh place versus the eighth place team. And then Golden State Sacramento is the ninth place versus the 10th place team. And then Wednesday in the Eastern Conference, you have Miami and Philadelphia in the play in seventh and eighth. And then the Hawks and the Bulls for ninth and 10th. Again, you win, you get in. But what I think is so exciting about the NBA play in as it does provide it doesn't don't hear me wrong it doesn't even come close to equating what March Madness is but people do love the aspect of having a one and done you know how you fix that is you go back to a normal format with four eight 16 teams whatever you want to do and instead of playing seven game series that take two weeks to go <laughs> through a series you shrink it to best of three. See, I love it. Best of I three, love seven. Best of five. I couldn't stay. Like, I stopped watching the NBA finals <laughs> a few years ago because there was like four nights between games. I love I it. I hated it. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. Why does it why does a series need to take a month to play? It's absurd. <laughs> so the only things that we do know are. In the um, playoffs, the teams that have actually made the playoffs. And the Clippers, the four seed, will play host to the Mavericks, the five seed. The Timberwolves will host the Suns to start. Uh, the Nuggets will get the winner of the seven seed, and then the Thunder will get the eighth seed. On the Eastern Conference side, Boston will get the eighth seed. Uh, Cleveland and Orlando are playing in round one. Orlando Magic made the playoffs do what? Think about that for a minute. Orlando making it before Charlotte. I don't know if anybody ever saw that coming. And then the Bucks and the Pacers are squaring off. That's a three and a six. And then the number two seed, Knicks, will get the seven seed. So they're starting. It's here. 60 seconds left to go in the show. Want to give you a heads up next Thursday, the 24th. Next Wednesday, excuse me, the 24th. Cole and I will be live at Ingalls Markets, 10903 Anderson Road in Piedmont. We'll be live there for Ingalls. And then on Thursday, we'll be live at Dave & Buster's Woodruff Road in Greenville. Coming up tomorrow, Cole, give people a little heads up. Yeah. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna guess, okay? We're going to do some strategery, some strategizing, and maybe try to answer the question, will a Clemson Tiger Ooh. or a South Carolina Gamecock come off the board first I like in it. this year's NFL draft? We'll get to that tomorrow. I'm Diesel. He's Cole Bryson. This is Wire to Wire. Go find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Give us a review. Give us a follow, a like, a subscribe, Hello. whatever you do. Help grow this show, you Tolos, and we'll see you tomorrow.
Madcraft Trey, thanks guys. We'll see you back here on the stream tomorrow.